Good morning, and welcome to the October Full House Open Meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. And on that note, I want to begin today by acknowledging that this is the first meeting where Commissioner Anna Gomez is joining us. Yeah. We are so excited to have her here. I know this agency is going to be well served by your great knowledge of communications policy, your uncommon international experience, and long record of public service. We consider ourselves lucky to now call you a colleague. I also want to say, hey, it's nice to have another woman up here with me. It's been a minute. Plus, as we close out Hispanic Heritage Month, I want to acknowledge that Commissioner Gomez is the first Latina to serve in this role in more than two decades. I think that the voices and perspectives shaping telecommunications policy need to reflect the country it aims to serve. And I look forward to working with you to advance the agency's mission to ensure the benefits of modern communications reach everyone everywhere. And before we get started, I also want to acknowledge something else that's new, but is unnerving. And that's the situation in the Middle East. There are no words that can adequately describe the horror of what we have witnessed. And so much of this terror has been documented on wireless phones. I don't know what comes next, but I know that this has made many people, including myself, feel uniquely vulnerable at this time because we see so much hatred in its purest form. But that vulnerability that is so real and so raw is not limited to the Jewish community. We see it too among those who have Palestinian ties. We see it in the devastating killing of a six-year-old Muslim boy in Illinois, an act that deserves our strongest and deepest condemnation. I have always been drawn to the Jewish tradition of tikkun olam and roughly translated, it means that we all have a duty to repair the world. I believe it. And I hope in days to come, we can find ways to do it, to bring hostages home, to support peace, and to demonstrate to those who feel most insecure and vulnerable a commitment to our shared humanity. And with that, Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda this morning? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you, and good morning, commissioners. First, I would like to remind everyone that the purpose of the Federal Communications Commission's open meeting is for the Commission to consider the matters that have been duly posted in accordance with the Government in the Sunshine Act. As provided in the Commission's rules, members of the public are invited to observe, which includes attending, listening, taking notes, but does not include participating in the meeting or addressing the Commission. Actions that purposely interfere or attempt to interfere with the commencement or conduct of the meeting or inhibit the audience's ability to observe or listen to the meeting, including attempts by audience members to address the commission while the meeting is in progress are not permitted. Any persons engaging in such behavior will be asked to leave the building. Anyone who refuses to leave voluntarily will be escorted from the building. Additionally, documents presented to the chairwoman, commissioners, or staff during the meeting will not become part of the official record of any commission proceeding, nor will they require further action by the commission. If you wish to comment on an ongoing proceeding before the commission, please visit our website for more information. Thank you so much for your cooperation. For today's meeting, you will hear six items for your consideration. First, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to reestablish the Commission's authority over broadband internet access service by classifying it as telecommunications service under Title II of the Communications Act, which would allow the Commission to protect consumers by issuing straightforward, clear rules to prevent internet service providers from engaging in practices harmful to consumers, competition, and public safety establish a uniform national regulatory approach rather than disparate requirements that vary state by state, strengthen the Commission's ability to secure communications networks and critical infrastructure against national security threats, and enable the Commission to protect public safety during natural disasters and other emergencies. 
Second, you will consider a declaratory ruling that would clarify that the use of Wi-Fi on school buses is an educational purpose and the provision of such service is therefore eligible for E-rate funding. Third, you will consider a notice of inquiry that will seek comment on the Commission's proposed plan to improve and enhance maternal health data in the Mapping Broadband Health in America platform in order to ensure that future updates to the platform reflect input from stakeholders and other interest, interested parties and improves the user experience. The platform was updated in June 2023 to incorporate publicly available data on maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity pursuant to the Data map Mapping to Save Mon Moms Lives Act. Fourth, you will consider a second report and order that would expand unlicensed use of the six gigahertz band by permitting very low power devices to operate in two subbands. A second further notice of proposed rulemaking that would propose to expand very low power device operations to the remainder of the band and a memorandum opinion and order that would address a remand from a court challenge of a previous decision in the docket. Fifth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking seeking comment on the use of high cost program funding to continue supporting fixed and mobile services in Alaska. The accompanying report and order makes administrative changes to streamline high cost program rules. Sixth, you will consider a report and order that would improve wireless emergency alerts by making WEA messages available in additional languages, including American Sign Language. Supporting maps that show the location of an emergency making it easier to conduct public-facing WEA performance and public awareness tests, and providing alert originators and members of the public with access to information about where and how WEA is available within their communities. This is your agenda for today. Please note the Media Bureau item titled Video Description, Implementation of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010, listed seventh on the agenda in the October 12th Sunshine Notice, has been adopted by the Commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item is titled Safeguarding and Securing the Open Internet and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and Trent Hartgrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. Mr. Harkrader, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to reestablish the Federal Communications Authority over Broadband Internet Access Service by classifying it as a telecommunications service under Title II of the Communications Act. The item also proposes rules to safeguard the open Internet. The item reflects the combined efforts of many across the agency. In addition to thanking the entire Wireline Competition Bureau team for their incredibly hard work on this item. I also thank our colleagues in the Public Safety and Homeland Security, Consumer and Governmental Affairs, Enforcement and Wireless Telecommunications Bureaus, as well as the Offices of Communications Business Opportunities, Economics and Analytics, International Affairs, and of course, last but not least, the Office of General Counsel for their review and incredibly helpful feedback. Seated at the table with me, from the Wireline Bureau are Adam Copeland, Deputy Bureau Chief, Jody May, Chief of the Competition Policy Division, Melissa Kirkle, who's Deputy Chief of the Competition Policy Division, and Chris Laughlin, who's also Deputy Chief in that division. Chris will now present the item. Thank you, Trent. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. While internet access has long been important to daily life, the COVID-19 pandemic and the rapid shift of work, education, and healthcare online demonstrated how essential broadband internet connections are for consumers' participation in our society and economy. Since the birth of the modern internet in the 1990s, the Federal Communications Commission has been the expert agency in ensuring that the internet is fast, open, and fair. However, the Commission abdicated that responsibility in 2018, just as the internet was becoming more vital than ever. The item before you proposes to reinstate the Commission's authority over broadband internet access service, providing the Commission with authority necessary to fulfill its obligations and objectives to safeguard the open internet, advance national security, and protect public safety, 
and proposes to reestablish conduct rules that would provide a national regulatory approach for safeguarding Internet openness. The not notice first proposes to reestablish the framework the Commission adopted in 2015 to classify broadband Internet access service as a telecommunications service and to classify mobile broadband Internet access service as a commercial mobile service. Next, in the event the Commission classifies broadband Internet access service as a telecommunications service, the notice proposes to forbear from applying 26 Title II provisions to broadband Internet access service while retaining statutory authority to enable the Commission to address national security and public safety concerns that could arise with respect to broadband Internet access service. The notice specifically proposes to forbear from all provisions of Title II that would permit the Commission's regulation of rates and from requiring universal service contributions from broadband providers. Finally, the item before you proposes to reestablish a national regulatory approach to protect the open Internet by preventing broadband Internet service providers from engaging in practices harmful to consumers, competition, and public safety, including proposing to restore straightforward, clear rules that prohibit blocking, throttling, or engaging in paid or affiliated prioritization arrangements, proposing to reinstate a general conduct standard that would prohibit unreasonable interference or unreasonable disadvantage to consumers or edge providers, and proposing to retain the disclosure requirements under the current transparency rule, and seeking comment on the means of disclosure, the interplay between the transparency rule and the Commission's broadband label requirements, and any additional enhancements or changes. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. <clears throat> Six years ago, Americans lived through one of the greatest hoaxes in regulatory history. They were told that the FCC's 2017 decision to overturn the Obama administration's failed two-year experiment with government control of the Internet, known as Title II, would quite literally break the Internet. It was a viral disinformation campaign replete with the requisite doses of Orwellian wordplay. Lots of discussion, as we'll hear today, about net neutrality, and virtually none at all about the actual issue before the FCC. Title II and the agency's application of sweeping 1930s-era utility regulations to the Internet. Now, rather than shedding light on this debate, far too many people in D.C. simply fanned the false flames of fear. Now, some have tried to memory hole this entire episode because it's not conducive to present goals. I think it's important to remember what exactly we were told about Title II. Senator Bernie Sanders stated that, quote, this is the end of the Internet as we know it. And if this passes, the Internet in its free exchange of information as we've come to know it, will cease to exist. Not may cease to exist, not might cease to exist, will cease to exist. Similarly, Senator Ed Markey stated that if the FCC kills net neutrality, the internet will never be the same. Unfixable, never be the same. And he said, if we don't save net neutrality, Ajit Pai will turn the internet into a digital oligarchy. Senator John Tester wrote that ending net neutrality ends the internet as we know it. Senate Democrats, similarly from their account, asserted that if we don't save net neutrality, you will get the Internet one word at a time. The media parroted these entirely false claims. The New York Times ran an article headlined, The Internet is Dying, Repealing Net Neutrality Hastens That Death. The article went on to state that, quote, a vote by the FCC to undo net neutrality would be the final pillow in its face. GQ, not one to let a cultural moment pass by, apparently, 
published in its news section an article titled, How the FCC Killing of Net Neutrality Will Ruin the Internet Forever. Now, not to be outdone, CNN ran a bolded banner headline across the top of its main page proclaiming end of the internet as we know it. The false claims only accelerated from there, if you can believe it. The co-founder of a progressive organization said this of the Republicans involved in the net neutrality repeal. They hate Americans, freedom, the flag, and the First Amendment. Now, not surprisingly, disturbed people believe the apocalyptic rhetoric that the so-called experts on this issue were feeding them. One person was sentenced to prison for threatening to murder the family of then FCC Chairman Ajit Pai over Title II. Another was indicted for calling in a bomb threat to the FCC's headquarters, which resulted us in having to evacuate the commission meeting room during the vote on Title II. Now, moving on from those clearly deranged individuals, let's turn back to some of the very specific predictions of harm that Title II's proponents laid out. They said that prices for broadband would spike. They said that you'd be charged for each website that you wanted to visit. And they said that the internet itself would slow down. Now, let's step back. Did any one of those predictions come to pass? Of course not. Since the FCC's 2017 decision to return the internet to the same successful bipartisan regulatory framework under which it thrived for decades, broadband speeds in the US are up six-fold on the mobile side. Prices are down. Competition has intensified, and record-breaking new broadband builds have brought millions of Americans across the digital divide. In other words, utility-style regulation of the internet was never about improving your online experience. That was just the sheep's clothing. It's always been about government control. But don't take my word for it. Uh, last month, when reports emerged that the FCC would soon head back down the path of applying vast and expansive utility-style controls to the internet, <clears throat> two of President Obama's former solicitors general, Don Verrilli and Ian Gershengorn, published their views. The two Obama administration alums described Title II this way, quote, classifying broadband internet access as a Title II telecom service would bring about an enormous and transformative expansion in the agency's regulatory authority over the national economy. It's their words. Continuing, the former Solicitor's General stated that regulating the internet as a Title II utility service, quote, <clears throat> would vastly expand the Commission's authority and would transform the way a federal agency regulates a vitally important element of our economy in the personal and social lives of hundreds of millions of Americans. Their words. They're telling the truth. The FCC should follow that example, and it should level with the American people. Years into this discussion, the public deserves an honest debate about the future of internet regulation, not just the repeated and talismanic invocation of the phrase net neutrality. We should be talking about whether it makes sense for this agency to apply 1930s era government controls to the modern internet. We should be talking about whether Washington should reserve to itself the freewheeling power to micromanage nearly every aspect of how the internet functions under this vague general internet conduct standard. After all, look, you might expect some degree of regulatory humility 
after the 2017 predictions failed to materialize, and it became clear to literally everyone, other than some partisan activists, that Title II is a solution that won't work to a problem that does not exist. But you'll find none of that in today's notice. Instead, the proponents of Title II are moving full steam ahead. Gone are the old justifications, replaced with new ones. The goalposts have moved, but the goal remains the same. Increasing government control over the internet. The new justifications for Title II that have been conjured up this time around, and they're just as far-fetched as the ones activists made up in 2017. They do not withstand even casual scrutiny. We're now told that Title II is necessary for national security. But the notice identifies no gap in national security that Title II would fill. Indeed, Congress has already empowered executive branch agencies with national security expertise, including the DOJ, DHS, Treasury, with the lead when it comes to security issues in the communications sector. It would be incredible, <clears throat> if it were true, that the FCC has known about a national security threat for years in our networks and simply stood by the wayside. Didn't seek to eliminate it through existing authorities or even new ones, and just waited to raise it until now. In fact, that's not credible. And the administration has the power it needs to deal with any bad actors without Title II. We're not told that Title II is necessary for law enforcement as well, but the FCC applied the Communications Assistant for Law Enforcement Act, CALEA, to broadband providers long ago without Title II regulation. We're now told that Title II is necessary for outage reports also, which advance public safety. Except the FCC already requires outage reports from services that are not subject to Title II, like VoIP. We're now told that Title II is necessary because COVID-19 demonstrated the importance of connectivity. But this takes the lessons learned from the pandemic and turns them on their head. COVID-19 exposed the error of applying Title II utility-like regulations to the internet as the European Union has long done. As I detailed in a separate statement with evidence, when online traffic spiked during COVID-19, EU officials asked Netflix and other streamers to down res to ration out their streams because they were afraid that Europe's fragile networks would break. The US had no need to ration service. Our network speeds exceeded those in Europe's during COVID-19 by 83%. And this is because our Title I regulatory approach encouraged investment in build-out. America's networks are not only faster than those in Europe, they're more competitive, cover a much higher percentage of households, and benefit from levels of investment that are three times higher than what you're seeing in Europe. So, no, now is not the time to make America's broadband networks look more like Europe's. We're now told that Title II is necessary to stop ISPs from engaging in blocking, throttling, and other sort of anti-consumer prioritizations. Wrong again. We have a free and open internet today without Title II. ISPs aren't engaging in that conduct for reasons that have nothing at all to do with Title II. The DC Circuit actually made this clear when it reviewed the FCC's 2015 Title II decision. That's when now Chief Judge Srina Vasan joined with Judge Tatel in a statement expressly noting that even with the FCC's Title II decision in place, ISPs are free to engage in, quote, blocking websites, unquote. The, quote, throttling of certain applications chosen by the ISP, unquote. And even the, quote, filtering of content into fast and slow lanes based on the ISP's commercial interests, unquote. 
provided that they simply disclose those practices. In other words, Title II, with all of its harms, does not even accomplish the purported goal that its advocates claim they're seeking here. Well, look, I don't mean to be so negative. I, you know, enough about what Title II fails to do. Let's talk about what utility-style regulations do achieve. For one, Title II includes rate regulation. As today's notice expressly proposes, there's no more surefire way of killing off investment and innovation than putting price controls squarely on the table. Adjudicating broadband rates under a just and reasonable standard should be a non-starter. For another, Title II would strip the nation's lead consumer protection agency, the Federal Trade Commission, of 100% of its authority over broadband. And that includes exempting ISPs from the FTC's privacy rules. What's more, federal law now prohibits the FCC from reimposing its old privacy rules on ISPs. For still another, Title II will hit Americans in their pocketbook. In fact, prices for utility-regulated services like electricity, water, and gas have been increasing over two times faster than the prices for internet services. Monopoly regulation invariably leads to monopoly prices. For yet another, Title II targets free data plans and other pro-consumer offerings like zero ratings. <clears throat> so if you like your plan, you may not be able to keep your plan. Title II will also slow down America's rural ISPs. Small and rural providers are already facing significant headwinds due to inflation, Bidenomics, the administration's failure to streamline the permitting process. The last thing that these broadband builders need right now is a regulatory onslaught from Washington. Yet that's exactly what Title II utility-style regulation entails. As the FCC determined in 2017, the agency's 2015 experiment with Title II negatively impacted small ISPs that serve rural communities. Indeed, those small ISPs reduced broadband infrastructure investment due to the FCC's 2015 Title II decision. So it should be clear by now that the FCC's efforts to <clears throat> revive utility-style regulation of the internet is not good policy. That's why its proponents keep layering on new shades of lipstick. But if that's not enough to convince you, it's also bad on the law. Here, once again, I agree with President Obama's lawyers. In the submission that the two respected solicitors general released last month, they address head on the question of the FCC's legal authority in light of the sea change in administrative law that's taken place since our 2015 Title II decision. In their words, an FCC decision applying Title II to the internet today, quote, would be struck down by the Supreme Court, end quote, under the major question doctrine as West Virginia versus EPA makes abundantly clear. Indeed, as the two appellate lawyers succinctly put it, the legal question in their words is, quote, an easy one. They went on to say, a commission decision reclassifying broadband as a Title II telecom service will not survive a Supreme Court encounter with the major questions doctrine. It will be folly for the commission and Congress to assume otherwise. As a lawyer and a former general counsel myself, it's rare that lawyers lose, use such definitive words. It's always, you can argue this, you can argue that. But their words are clear. They know what they're talking about. It will not survive a Supreme Court encounter with the major questions doctrine. While some now argue that the Supreme Court's Brand X opinion supports an FCC decision to classify broadband as a Title II service, the former Obama Solicitor General put that claim to rest too. As they explain, the Supreme Court's finding of statutory ambiguity in Brand X precludes the FCC from applying Title II today because the Supreme Court now requires more than mere ambiguity before a court can rule in favor of an agency that's seeking to expand its authority 
on a major question like this one. Finally, I think it's important to take a step back. The, uh, the hockey star Wayne Gretzky, he famously described his play by saying this, I skate to where the puck is going, not where it's been. In my view, every government official should strive to meet the Gretzky test. One of the things we must do is focus on emerging trends and challenges. We should lay the foundation for new innovations and new forms of competition. We should tackle the issues that consumers care about today and into the future. We shouldn't spend our time staring into the regulatory rearview mirror or relitigating disputes that have long since passed from relevancy. Yet that's precisely what the agency does today with Title II. I'd encourage my colleagues to change course and focus the FC's work on the numerous important subjects that Congress has authorized the Commission to address, from rural broadband to spectrum to universal service reform. Heading down the path to Title II will not only push vital FCC matters onto the back burner, it will knock many of them off the stove altogether. So how do we get here? I don't mean how do we get here in the sense that President Biden signed an executive order in 2021 calling on the FCC to take this step. I don't mean how did we get here in the sense that President Obama published a YouTube video in 2014 to pressure, successfully I might add, the then FCC chair into embracing Title II. I mean it in a more fundamental way. How do we really get here? The answer to that question goes back almost 20 years, all the way back to 2005. Now, that's when a handful of then emerging Silicon Valley upstarts, including Google, first asked DC to heavily regulate their ISP competitors. The tech companies wanted to create a moat around their business models to foreclose any competition for decades to come and to divert attention away from their abusive conduct. So Big Tech's allies came up, came up with a catchy branding for their regulatory rent-seeking, net neutrality. But what's happened in the many years since Google first launched this effort? Well, predictably, it's the tech companies not ISPs, that have emerged as dominant gatekeepers that are abusing market power. Big tech is the one blocking the sharing of disfavored news stories, not ISPs. Big tech is the one threatening to freeze payment accounts and fine users for the content of their speech, not ISPs. And big tech is the one censoring lawful videos and documentaries not ISPs. Indeed, it's interesting. The Biden administration right now is currently suing Google and others just across the river here because the administration, the Biden administration, believes that they have amassed too much power and that they must be reined in. And yet over here on this side of the river, the FCC is proposing to extend new protections to those very same companies through Title II. Just what Google first asked for all those years ago. Talk about backwards looking. In closing, I am, uh, I'm well aware that neither my position nor reason will prevail today. Reinstating Title II is now an article of faith for many in Washington and a handy fundraising tool to boot. But make no mistake, any FCC decision to impose Title II on the internet will be overturned by the courts, by Congress, or by a future FCC. I dissent. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. First, 
I would like to welcome uh, fellow Commissioner Gomez. I am excited about your expertise, your knowledge, uh, the passion that you'll bring, uh, and I look forward to standing shoulder to shoulder with you. To the item. Now more than ever, the internet must remain free and open. In my years as a commissioner, I've learned that there is simply no way to overstate broadband's impact on the lives of individual Americans. Take, for example, Queen Bee, as she is known in the Yesler Terrace public housing facility in Seattle, Washington. Talk about a megawatt smile. Queen Bee experienced homelessness for a number of years, was able to find housing just as the pandemic started, and critically, uh, just as she became ill and lost some of her mobility. She took advantage of that time to go back to school, having previously stopped her formal education at the eighth grade. With her broadband connection, she literally and figuratively zoomed through her education and training, learned how to use a computer and applications like Excel. When we met, she proudly told me that she has become an educator herself in the community, training others on how to utilize and upgrade computer skills because she wanted to help others learn just like she had. She told me it was a blessing, quote, to have the internet. Amen to that. Consider as well Miss Anna, the leader of the Bethel Native Corporation. She graciously welcomed me into her home in Bethel, Alaska this past summer with a bowl of moose chili. There are no major roads in Bethel. If you want to leave town or visit, you have to do it through a boat or on a plane. And as we ate, Miss Anna told me about her exciting vision, the community's exciting vision of tomorrow, new fiber deployments that would enable her community of 6,000 and the residents of the even smaller villages along the Kuskoswim River to secure the necessities of modern life without having to leave the place that they call home employment through remote work, health care with telehealth visitants, better education for all of the community's kids. And let me tell you about Miss Eleanor, a senior living in Boston's Roxbury neighborhood. She would visit the Grove Hall Library there and use the computer until she ultimately got herself online through the library's Tech Goes Home program. It helps residents purchase affordable laptops if they need it and connect them to broadband. And so with a twinkle in her eye, Miss Eleanor told me how she loves to learn new line dances and how that her connection to the internet helps keep her active. These are stories that I know, people that I have heard from. And so from single story Pueblos in New Mexico to the high rise skyscrapers of New York, family farmers to small business owners, the youngest learners to the eldest seniors. No one should tell these Americans how they can and can't use the internet. And no one should be able to exploit or leverage their connection that they cherish. Each in their own special way has shared with me how essential their internet connection is. And so I'm here today to tell them, I know I've got your back. Some today may want to talk about what is the proper regulatory framework. One of the reasons I support, firmly support today's notice is because it does propose to return us to our roots, a framework that has governed the Internet's growth going back to 1998 through Republican and Democratic administrations alike, when the Commission first classified DSL broadband as a common carrier service and went on to adopt principles to ensure broadband networks are widely deployed, open, affordable, and accessible to consumers. It's a framework that puts users in charge of what they do online and not the companies that they pay for a connection. It's a framework that protects consumers in their use of an essential service instead of simply trusting ISPs to do the right thing. And it's a framework that recognizes network security is national security. Instead of hoping for the best in a world where so many wish us harm, Congress created the commission in part for the purpose of the national defense. In today's world, that mission is more important than ever. 
Wars in the Ukraine and the Middle East include significant cyber components, and every minute bad actors, and it's sometimes backed by nation states, including Russia and China, probe our broadband networks for weaknesses and for the potential to launch a crippling cyber attack. ISPs are working hard, good on them, to protect their networks. We're working with them on this urgent and critical goal. But we can't afford to rely on self-regulation alone. Not when our national security is at stake and not when our, net, uh, our nation's networks are that vital. Reclassification would put the Commission on a firm footing to protect Americans and partner even more effectively with our sister national security agencies on this goal as well. Those partners have already reached out to the FCC uh, through other items to examine all of our solutions and authorities to help secure our networks. And gaps in our authority have, in fact, already manifested and hindered our ability to defend against known threats. Here's one example. We rightfully and unanimously, I would note, revoked the International 214 authorizations of certain Chinese providers following recommendations from the executive branch. However, because of the repeal of the 2015 Open Internet Rules, those revocations only prohibited those specific Chinese providers from offering common carrier service. Our national security action did not touch their BIS offerings, meaning that providers already identified as posing an unacceptable national security and law enforcement risk may be operating BIS networks in the United States without recourse. Whether or not they offered BIS, they could be interconnecting with our networks and gaining access to important internet points of presence and data centers. This is part of a larger problem, one of which is why I continue to call for a closer look at the threats that adversarial providers pose to our data and our data centers. And the rules proposed in the notice can better equip us with the tools we need to protect Americans against these risks. And it's not just national security that would benefit more and more offerings form uh, an integral part of public safety communications. As an example, I'm reminded of my time visiting a large public safety answering point in Las Vegas. Packed in that PSAP were dedicated, dedicated 911 communications technicians who spend their shifts day after day, week after week, answering calls that save people's lives. But one thing is obvious, many of those in need rely on broadband to call for help. And this is even more profound for individuals with disabilities who use broadband to call 911 for help through VRS and other applications. And so at the same time, we know that public safety entities often rely on public broadband to share data with emergency responders and communicate in real time. The Commission must be able to protect consumers and public safety professionals in their use of these services, and the rules proposed in the notice would help us do just that. Some have questioned our authority to act even though the D.C. Circuit upheld the exact rules we propose to reinstate. They predict sky is falling, the Supreme Court will no longer defer to reasonable interpretations of agency statutes and that the loss of deference spells the loss of a free and open internet. And staying within our statutory bounds, uh, bounds, of course, is extremely important to me. I'm going to take a close look at the record that develops. But I note that there is a real history here as well, right? Over the more than 20 years of courts reviewing this exact question, Every single judge to take a position on the correct classification of broadband has concluded that it very obviously is a common carrier service. Three Supreme Court justices explicitly stated that the answer was, quote, perfectly clear. How many judges have ever said that broadband plainly is not a common carrier service? That answer is perfectly clear, too. The answer is zero, not a single one. There's more. Over the 20 years, the Supreme Court also said that Congress very obviously gave us the authority to decide the question of what counts 
as a telecommunications service. It did so even after it decided a trilogy of cases viewed as the genesis of what we now call the major questions doctrine. Evidently, calling a telecommunications service telecommunications service, as we've done for years, is not packing a mountain into a statutory molehill. Even if it were somehow, shoehorning broadband into a definition of an information service surely would be much more of one. Let me close. We need to remember that as we adopt this notice, we are not reinventing the wheel. The 2015 Open Internet Order adopted rules designated to protect an open internet by prohibiting conduct that we should all agree is harmful. Don't block legal content. Don't throttle legal content. Don't engage in paid prioritization. Don't make it harder for the internet to drive competition, create new ideas, spur new technologies. More fundamentally, don't make broadband the only essential service in America without real oversight, certainly not when our security and public safety are at stake. I do look forward to the record, reviewing it. I thank the chairwoman and the team for uh, this item. Uh, in addition, supporting some of the edits that I made to the item, suggested to the item, including those that further support how important I really view uh, this proceeding is to our national security. Thank many at the commission uh, for their very hard work on this item uh, and for their dedicated work. It has my support. All right, Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you. I'd also like to uh, welcome Commissioner Gomez. The notice we consider today proposes rules that are unnecessary, dangerously overbroad, and unlikely to survive judicial review. They're unlikely to serve the public interest. If implemented, they would ban or cripple services and products that Americans want, and as such, I have no choice but to dissent. To show why the rules are unnecessary, let's briefly consider failed claims by Title II advocates. Free speech. American consumer internet service providers don't restrict free speech. They promote it very visibly. American speech is suppressed not by them online, but mostly by big tech platforms. Title II advocates always claimed that we need the Title II for free speech, even calling it the First Amendment issue of our time. It turns out that American ISPs don't have a speech problem, and the inventor of net neutrality is on record that the First Amendment is obsolete anyway. Next, the internet was not in fact destroyed. When it became clear that they didn't really care about free speech, Title II advocates shifted instead to saying that the survival of the internet was at risk. They helpfully made specific claims that are very easy to fact check. Some of these were, it will cost 25 cents to send a tweet. It will cost $2 to search on Google, and you'll get the internet one word at a time. Obviously, none of this happened. Next, people didn't die. This one really shouldn't need too many examples. People claimed that ending Title II net neutrality would kill people. It didn't. But won't it make the internet faster and cheaper? American broadband service used to be slower than Europe's. That's no longer true. Depending on the ranking, the United States is typically 10th or 11th in the world ahead of countries with legal net neutrality, like Finland, Norway, the United Kingdom, Germany. Most of the countries ahead of us, furthermore, are smaller countries, like Monaco or Singapore, that have fewer challenges with geography than we do. These gains largely came in while home broadband was a Title I service. If someone thinks it would have been even better under Title II, that's a hard case to make. We're faster than lots of countries with net neutrality. As for price, the chairwoman is on the record saying that she has no plans to regulate prices under Title II. And if we tried, I'd like to point out that it would probably be impossible to set a fair price. We couldn't do it properly when we were just regulating one big phone company. How could we possibly do this for dozens of ISPs, including satellites and radio ISPs? Next, we turn to national security. The FCC can ban foreign companies from having phone company licenses. These rules would extend the concept to ISPs. That isn't the worst idea, but the U.S. government doesn't need the FCC to grab at this authority through Title II classification. It has CFIUS, the ICTS supply chain rule. Congress could pass a law tomorrow if Congress believed that there were any gaps. Next, we'll turn to the, the question of the way in which the proposed rules are dangerously overbroad. Several effects of the rules should worry everyone who hopes for more advanced technology. 
it's easy to say regulation kills innovation, but I believe Americans deserve concrete examples. So first, 5G will be crippled. Once 5G technology is everywhere, a phone company can slice its network so that different phones and other devices get different features. For example, one slice could carry emergency services calls, another could monitor street traffic and report into an app, and a third could support high volume video. Multiple services on a single network could be bound under Title II, and without advanced uses for 5G, there's frankly no point in upgrading. Second, consumers will pay for traffic dumping. Title II is attractive to big tech companies because no throttling means ISPs have to take all incoming traffic and charge their customers for it. So if an internet company sends a lot of traffic your way, your ISP will have to charge you for the expense of building a network that can handle that while the internet company takes home all the profits. This is such a big problem in other countries that the European Union, Canada, and South Korea all adopted or are adopting laws precisely to address this problem and charge high traffic companies for network uh, infrastructure expenses. Finally, something that hasn't, I think, gotten sufficient attention. Factories won't get service. Modern wireless technology enables reaction times 10 times faster than the fastest human, and AI training can make manufacturing more efficient and productive. This is already happening in other countries like China. The general conduct standard in the proposed rules would make this technology risky to build, because if there was any crossover with consumer service, the technology would come under Title II. Think of it this way, if having a computer put you under Title II, we'd never have put computers in factories. Now I'd, I'd like to turn to judicial review. I'm not going to tell the courts how to rule on the major questions doctrine or on whether the Section 10 forbearances that this order uses will hold up in court. If they don't hold up, of course, the Title II regime falls apart. But I will note that an agency constantly changing its mind without any evidence of a problem is classic arbitrary and capricious behavior. Additionally, focusing on ISPs when they're less powerful and monopolistic than big tech companies raises still more questions about arbitrary and capricious action. The FCC hasn't really addressed whether internet companies that aren't ISPs could still be common carriers under the Part 1 rules of Title II. If they can, that's obviously the first place we should go for relief to protect free speech and consumer choice. Finally, against the public interest. I can't be the only person who's noticed that tech seems to be slowing down, not computers, New computer advances are happening all the time, from AI chatbots writing your grocery list at the you know, uh, more amusing and simpler end, to decoding burned scrolls written in ancient Greek. But not that much seems to cash out into real tangible improvements in daily life. And that's because the physical world is hard for computers to deal with. You need a lot of compute. You need a lot of bandwidth. It's frankly easier for a computer to play grandmaster chess than to recognize an expression on your face or to direct a robot to get you a soda out of the fridge. I believe we need much more connectivity and computing to solve the hard problems of the physical world. Safer, better cars, cheaper, more energy efficient manufacturing, and life-saving emergency response anywhere on the planet. All these are potentially held back by Title II classification of broadband. What we're doing right now is working fine. We don't need to change. Service has gotten faster, better, and cheaper quickly, so much so that some of our old broadband programs don't even count as broadband anymore because expectations have changed so rapidly. Our expectations are way up. We should keep them there. I'd also like to note that everything that internet freedom and network neutrality meant in the early days of the internet has just become normal today without the FCC having to enforce anything. You can freely access legal content, browse sites of your choice, connect any device or any protocol you want, run any application you want without your ISP forcing you to use slow routing. All of those things happened through normal marketplace operations and consumer expectations. And if those are familiar phrases, those are drawn from the seminal 2003 net neutrality paper um, from Chairman Powell's famous Four Freedom speech and from the 2005 FCC Internet Freedom Policy Statement. We're now faced with advocates who can't accept that they won and that we have de facto net neutrality. And therefore, the rationales have shifted and we have a new set of rationales for Title II today. One final comment on internet speeds as well. A lot of internet plumbing had to be reimagined to, to deal with uh, the changes away from bilateral networks with, uh, with settlement free peering to the model in the rich uh, audiovisual media era of large tra unpeered traffic volumes. And the internet plumbing complexity here does not just stop at line speeds and does not just stop at peering. Enabling one home router 
to connected to one wire to carry voice, video, data, gaming all at once. These are hard coordination problems. Most of the growing pains in getting here have not been due to deficiencies in line speed or due to any misbehavior, alleged or real, by any ISP. They were about technical problems like buffer bloat, refers buffering too much data and causing connections to reset, or router firmware that couldn't serve the different latency and throughput needs of VoIP and web traffic at the same time. Look, network engineering is hard and competitive, and most of the advances in this area are about mani managing traffic at the device level, not about any deficiencies in ISP performances. From my perspective, ISPs are the most competitive they've ever been, and forcing utility regulation onto them now is the wrong move at the wrong time. So I dissent. And in our first, Commissioner Gomez. Thank you very much. Um, First, uh, I do want to uh, say I'm thinking of all my friends and colleagues around the world during these difficult times, and I thank you for your remarks earlier. Second, it is such an honor to be here. Uh, as someone who's been in Telegon for 30 years, I hate saying that. <laughs> I've sat in this audience. I've been a young attorney who presented at the open meeting. And I've sat next to attorneys as a bureau manager so thank you uh, to my colleagues and to the FCC staff for your warm welcome. The past few weeks have flown by, uh, and I'm grateful for all the FCC staff and stakeholders who have taken the time to meet with me. While I understood the assignment I was walking into, uh, the past three weeks have deeply emphasized the importance of what we are doing here today. Everyone, from stakeholders, industry, to civil rights and public interest groups, each one has underscored the centrality of broadband to our lives. Yet, at a national level, we do not have a regulatory framework to ensure that this critical conduit remains accessible and secure. I want to be very clear about what we are considering. Today, we are opening a proceeding to seek public comment about how best to safeguard and secure broadband infrastructure protect consumers, and ensure the internet remains open and available to all content providers and consumers. We propose to align the ongoing historic investment in broadband deployment with policies that will protect the openness and the integrity of these same networks. This proceeding is not about controlling internet content. It is not about stifling investment, regulating rates, or reducing competition. It is not about controlling the internet. Instead, the proposed net neutrality rules will ensure that access to the internet remains open so that all viewpoints, including those with which I disagree, are heard. More so, these principles protect consumers while also maintaining a healthy, competitive broadband internet ecosystem because we know that competition is required for access to a healthy, open internet that is accessible to all. As we are pursuing reestablishing these rules, we must prioritize consumers. We must pay attention to communities who have been historically left on the wrong side of the digital divide. While we all risk to lose out by not taking action to ensure that we have proper guardrails in place, it is historically underserved communities who will risk to lose the most. So I, too, look forward to a substantial record developing, and I am sure it will be substantial and to listening to consumers and stakeholders on the best approaches to keep this critical resource of the internet open and accessible for all. Thank you to the staff throughout the agency for their work on this item and to the Wireline Competition Bureau for leading dra the drafting efforts. And now I want to make my remarks in Spanish. Es un gran honor estar aquí. He trabajado en el ámbito de las telecomunicaciones por 30 años. He sido parte de la audiencia. He sido una joven abogada que ha presentado en juntas como esta. Y me he sentado junto a abogados como gerente en uno de los departamentos de la comisión. Quiero agradecer a mis colegas y al personal de la comisión por su cálida bienvenida. Las últimas semanas han pasado volando y estoy agradecida con todo el personal de la comisión y con todos quienes han venido a visitarme. Aunque comprendí muy bien la tarea, 
que me esperaba. Las últimas tres semanas han reafirmado rotundamente la importancia de lo que la Comisión hace hoy. Todos, desde la industria hasta los grupos de derechos civiles y de interés público, han subrayado la importancia de la Internet de banda ancha en nuestras vidas. Sin embargo, a nivel nacional, no contamos con un marco regulatorio que garantice que esta conexión de crítica importancia siga siendo accesible y segura. Quiero clarificar lo que estamos considerando. Hoy damos inicio a un procedimiento para recibir comentarios del público sobre la mejor manera de salvaguardar y asegurar la infraestructura de banda ancha, proteger a los consumidores y garantizar que la Internet permanezca abierta y disponible para todos. Proponemos alinear la histórica inversión federal destinada actualmente a la instalación de banda ancha con políticas que protejan la apertura y la integridad de dichas redes. Este procedimiento no consiste en controlar el contenido del Internet. No consiste en sofocar la inversión, regular las tarifas o reducir la competencia. No consiste en controlar la Internet. En cambio, las reglas propuestas por, para la neutralidad de la red garantizarán que el acceso a Internet permanezca abierto, de modo que, es, que se escuchen todos los puntos de vista, incluidos aquellos con los que no estoy de acuerdo. Más aún, estos principios protegen a los consumidores y al mismo tiempo mantienen un ecosistema de Internet de banda ancha, ancha robusto y competitivo, porque sabemos que se requiere competencia para acceder a una Internet robusta, abierta y accesible para todos. Mientras buscamos restablecer estas reglas, debemos priorizar a los consumidores. Debemos prestar atención a las comunidades que históricamente han quedado en el lado equivocado de la brecha digital. Aunque todos nos arriesgamos al fracaso si no tomamos medidas para garantizar las protecciones adecuadas, son las comunidades que históricamente han sido desatendidas las que arriesgan mayores pérdidas. Espero que haya un registro sustancial de comentarios y así poder conocer la opinión de los consumidores y de otras partes interesadas respecto a cuáles serían las mejores formas y enfoques para que este recurso de crítica importancia, que es la Internet, se mantenga abierto y accesible para todos. Gracias a la Oficina Competencia en Línea Fija, that's you, Wireline Competition Bureau, y a todos los miembros de esta agencia que han trabajado en este tema. Many thanks. Thank you, commissioners. It was three and a half years ago when we were told to stay home, hunker down, and move work, life, and school online. But too many of us were left out and left behind without the broadband connections required for day-to-day -day activities. We all saw it. Kids with laptops perched on their knees, lingering outside of fast food restaurants just to catch a wireless signal to go to online class. Adults sitting in parked cars wherever they could find Wi-Fi so that they could keep up with family, friends, and work. And seniors who had to turn down telemedicine appointments because they didn't have the bandwidth they needed to keep up with their health care. That moment made it crystal clear that broadband is no longer nice to have. It's need to have for everyone, everywhere. Broadband is an essential service. That's why Congress invested tens of billions of dollars into building out our networks and making access more affordable and more equitable, including the historic $65 billion investment in the bipartisan infrastructure law. 
And that is why at the FCC, we stood up the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is helping 21 million households get online and stay online. We understand that in the United States, we need broadband to reach 100% of us, and we need it fast, open, and fair. But even as we recognized that our lives are being transformed and we were doing anything and everything online, our institutions failed to keep pace. Today, there is no expert agency ensuring that the internet is fast, open, and fair. And for everyone everywhere to enjoy the full benefits of the internet age, internet access needs to be more than just accessible and affordable. The internet needs to be open. That is why, for as long as I have served on the FCC, I have supported net neutrality. But in 2017, despite overwhelming opposition, the FCC repealed net neutrality and stepped away from its Title II authority over broadband. That decision put the agency on the wrong side of history, the wrong side of the law, and the wrong side of the American public. Remember, 80% of people in this country support net neutrality. Today, we give, begin a process to make this right. We propose to reinstate enforceable bright line rules to prevent blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization. These rules are legally sustainable because they track those that were upheld in court in 2016 from front to back. They would ensure that the internet remains open and a haven for creating without permission, building community beyond geography, and organizing without physical constraints. But reenacting legally sustainable net neutrality rules is not the end of the story. Because in the subsequent years, events proved why broadband is essential and why we need to restore this agency's Title II authority. Let's talk about public safety. With Title II classification, the FCC would have the authority to intervene when firefighters in Santa Clara, California, had the wireless connectivity on one of their command vehicles throttled when responding to wildfires. Title II would also bolster our authority to require providers to address internet outages, like in Hope Village, a neighborhood in Detroit that suffered through a 45-day internet outage during the pandemic and had little recourse. Because when the FCC turned away from overseeing broadband, the only mandatory outage reporting system we can have in place is focused on long distance voice service outages. And in a modern digital economy where we live our lives online, let's face it, that doesn't cut it. Consider national security. While the agency has taken a series of bipartisan actions to reduce our dependence on insecure telecommunications equipment and keep potentially hostile actors from connecting to our networks, it is not enough to keep our adversaries at bay. When we stripped state-affiliated companies from China of their authority to operate in the United States, that action did not extend to broadband services, thanks to the retreat from Title II. This is a national security loophole that needs to be addressed. Think about cybersecurity. We are actively working with our federal partners on cybersecurity planning, coordination, and response, including on issues like secure internet routing in order to prevent malicious state actors from exploiting protocols that make it possible for them to hijack our internet traffic. But without reclassification, we have limited authority to incorporate updated cybersecurity standards into our network policies. Then look at privacy. The law requires telecommunications providers to protect the confidentiality of the proprietary information of their customers. That means that these providers cannot sell your location data, among other sensitive information. Those privacy protections currently extend to voice customers, but not broadband subscribers. Does that really make sense? Do we want our broadband providers selling what we do online? Scraping our service for a payday from new artificial intelligence models? Doing any of this without our permission? Let me say a few words about what we are not doing here. This is not a stalking horse for rate regulation. No how, no way. We know competition is the best way to bring down rates for consumers, and approaches like the Affordable Connectivity Program are the best bet 
for making sure service is affordable for all. We will not let broadband providers, gatekeepers to the internet, dictate what we can and cannot do online. And we will not undermine incentives to invest in broadband networks, which were as robust as ever when these rules were back in place. Plus, Title II will make it easier for competitive providers to access poll attachments and apartment buildings. On top of this, restoring our open internet policies will mean that, if, that a uniform national framework applies to the whole country. Because if you hear cries that nothing has happened since the FCC retreated from net neutrality and are asking yourself, what is the big deal? Think again. Because when the FCC stepped back from having these policies in place, the court said states can step in. So when Washington withdrew, California rode in with its own regime. Other states, too. All in all, nearly a dozen put net neutrality rules in state law, executive orders, or contracting policies. So in effect, we have open internet policies that providers are abiding by right now. They're just coming from Sacramento and places like it. But when you are dealing with the most essential infrastructure in the digital age, come on, it's time for a national policy. In the wake of the pandemic, we know that broadband is a necessity and not a luxury. That's why we made a historic commitment to connect all of us to broadband. Now we have work to do to make sure that it's fast, open, and fair. And for their work on this rulemaking, I want to thank Callie Croker, Adam Copeland, CJ Ferraro, Trent Harkrader, Melissa Kirkel, Chris Lachlan, and Jody May from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Garnet Hanley and Jennifer Salas from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Jerusha Barnett, Diane Burstein, Erica McMahon, Susie Rosen Singleton, and Christy Thornton from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Hunter Dealey, Loyan Egal, Pam Gallant, Rosemary McEnry, and Rakesh Patel from the Enforcement Bureau, Justin Kane, Ken Carlberg, John Evanoff, David Firth, Deb Jordan, Nicole McGinnis, Zenji Nakahawa, Erica Olson, Austin Rendazzo, Jim Schlichting, and Chris Smeek from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Eugene Kisilev, Julia McHenry, Eric Ralph and Michelle Schaefer from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Melena Barzilai, Sarah Citron, Michael Jansen, Doug Klein, Marcus Mayer, Rick Mallins, Scott Novak, Anjali Singh, Elliot Tarloff, and Shin Yu from the Office of General Counsel, and Denise Coca, Kathleen Collins, Francis Gutierrez, Gabrielle Kim, Ethan Lucarelli, and Thomas Sullivan from the Office of International Affairs. We will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Dissent. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Dissent. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, we got a lot more going on today, so please announce the next <laughs> item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item two on your agenda is titled Modernizing the E-Rate Program for Schools and Libraries and will also be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Trent Hartrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Good morning again, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a declaratory ruling that, if adopted, will clarify that the use of Wi-Fi on school buses is eligible for E-rate funding. I'd like to thank the Bureau team and our colleagues in the Office of General Counsel, the Office of the Managing Director, and the Office of Economics and Analytics for their work on this item. Seated at the table with me from the Bureau are Allison Baker, Associate Bureau Chief, Jody Griffin, Division Chief of TAPD, Janae Schreiber, Deputy Division Chief in TAPD, and Molly O'Connor, who's an attorney, an ACE attorney in TAPD. Molly will now present the item. Thank you, Trent. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today's declaratory ruling, if adopted, would clarify that the use of Wi-Fi on school buses serves an educational purpose as defined by the E-rate program rules, and therefore, the provision of such service is eligible for E-rate funding. The E-Rate program provides support to eligible schools and libraries for affordable high-speed broadband services and internal connections to connect today's students and library patrons with next-generation learning opportunities and services. The Communications Act and the E-Rate program rules require schools and libraries to use E-Rate-supported services primarily for educational purposes. 
In the case of schools, the Commission has defined educational purposes as activities that are integral, immediate, and proximate to the education of students. Many students across the country still lack a reliable broadband connection at home and have a need for connectivity to complete homework and other assignments before and after school hours, including on bus rides to and from school and other school activities. As such, this item, if adopted, would enable these students to fully engage in their education and complete homework or other assignments before or after school hours. The Commission has permitted the use of E-rate funded services off campus in other circumstances where it determined the use served an educational purpose. Consistent with these past determinations, this declaratory ruling would clarify that the use of Wi-Fi or other similar access point technologies on school buses is an educational purpose and the provision of such service is therefore eligible for E-rate funding. Accordingly, the declaratory ruling, if adopted, directs the Bureau to fund the provision of Wi-Fi on school buses as well as the eligible equipment needed to enable such services as part of the E-rate program's funding year 2024 eligible services list proceeding and to issue a supplemental public notice seeking comment on the specific services and equipment that should be funded. The staff recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now hear comments from the bench. We'll start with Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Uh, in March of 2021, when the U.S. and the world at large was still uh, very directly grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ARPA. Uh, that law included nearly $7.2 billion for the FCC to establish a new Emergency Connectivity Fund, ECF. Now, in contrast to Section 254 of the Communications Act, which is the statutory authority for our E-rate program, ARPA expressly authorized the FCC to fund eligible equipment and services at locations, quote, other than the school. Here at the Commission, I worked with my FCC colleagues and others in the Bureau to maximize the impact that this program would have on connecting school kids. And I voted in favor of agency rules implementing that program, including funding for Wi-Fi connectivity on school buses as outlined in the statute. In addition to the emergency relief provided under the ARPA's ECF, Congress allocated billions of additional dollars to other agencies since the start of COVID-19 that could be used for connecting school kids. Indeed, the Department of Education's Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund alone received approximately $190 billion in total funding. So when this item was placed on our agenda for the meeting, I asked some basic questions to understand what's worked with the billions of dollars already spent, what hasn't, and what potentially are some lessons learned uh, going forward uh, for those that want to fund Wi-Fi on school buses. The information that I wanted was not entirely there. For example, the FCC has provided over $60 million in ECF funds to provide Wi-Fi on school buses, but we don't have a real accounting of the number of students that have been connected or the ways in which these connections have been used. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that we have any studies that measure the uh, efficacy of this funding in terms of improved academic outcomes or that recommend ways that the initiative itself could be improved. It also appears that the Department of Education doesn't track any useful metrics for the billions of dollars that it has already sent out the door. Not on the number of Wi-Fi enabled school buses that it's funded, not on the number of children that the funding has connected, and not on the impact of all those funds. I previously raised concerns that a lack of coordination and accounting of federal broadband funding could result in significant waste and an inability to track the efficacy of federal sp spending. And I'm concerned that that's what we're seeing here. Now, given the lack of data, it strikes me that the agency's decision-making process would benefit from seeking comment on some of these points before moving ahead. And that's why I would have been willing to vote in favor of a notice of proposed rulemaking today. I think the challenges here will only be compounded by proceeding directly to a declaratory ruling. 
I'm also concerned that we're expanding the USF program into an entirely new funding area without addressing some of the fundamental contributions, disbursement, and oversight concerns that I and others have been raising with respect to USF. We can't continue to spend other people's money in this way without a real conversation about reform. I put some ideas out there. I welcome a discussion about various paths forward. I also have serious legal concerns with this decision today. Ranking member Cruz and Chair Rogers recently reminded the commission that unlike ARPA and ECF, the FCC's, quote, E-rate authority is explicitly confined to classrooms, end quote. And Congress is clearly aware of this limitation, as evidenced by the explicit provisions of ARPA that directed the commission to extend funding beyond the school. And Dean, I'm pretty confident that today's vote is just another step towards even further expansion in the not too distant future. You can look no further, really, than those who are calling on the FCC to take this action and more, including a recent statement from former FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler. In his words, quote, You've got to ask yourself the question, what is a school? And the school is where learning takes place. If that learning is in a classroom or a study hall or a school bus, the school is where learning takes place. Now, the, the, the problem with this Wheeler Wi-Fi plan is that it reads the express language that Congress included in the statute right out of the act. And his words show that the plan has no limiting principle. Now, those of us on the commission today share so many common goals, but the FCC isn't free to ignore the express limitations on our authority imposed by Congress, no matter how laudable the agency's intentions may be. So for that reason, I'm unable to support the item, and I dissent. Thanks to the team for your work on it. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. For some students, their, stu their school day starts well before the first bell. They catch the bus early before the sun rises, bored uh, to start a long commute to school and come back uh, when um, the sun is potentially starting to set. It's been a long-standing way of life for many, in particular, rural and tribal students. Um, and I'll have a longer statement for the record, but take my home state of Kansas, for example. It's a big state. Uh, where farms stretch uh, for miles and frequently in the most rural parts of the state you can't even see your neighbor. And so when it's time for school, students who catch the bus frequently have a long road ahead for them. But thanks to advances in connectivity, students now could be using this time to and from school productively to study, to learn, do their homework. Uh, and this is particularly valuable when you consider that many of those students may lack a home quality broadband connection uh, at home. Uh, in addition uh, to some of the precedent that we have here, uh, for example, back in 2003, commission previously determined school bus drivers uh, use of wireless telecom services um, uh, was eligible for E-rate support. If we're permitting the school bus driver uh, under E-rate, it's past time that we also offer that certainly to the students on the same school bus, and so I support today's item. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Starks, your uh, remarks about take distance between neighbors and cannabis remind me of a local expression mm -hmm. from my, when I was growing up. It was, uh, it's so empty and so flat that, you know, when your do dog runs away, you can see him go for three days. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I'm disappointed that the commission has decided to pursue this unlawful course of action. The Telecommunications Act could not state more clearly that E-rate may only be used to subsidize internet connectivity for school classrooms and libraries, and a school bus is neither a classroom nor a library. This item therefore eviscerates Congress's restrictions on E-rate and makes an unfortunate mockery of the law. If Congress had meant for E-rate to apply to any educational purpose broadly defined, Congress could have said so. Instead, it chose to specifically limit the applicability of the program to school classrooms and libraries. All attempts to expand it beyond these bounds are thus uh, evidently unlawful. This alone should be an open and shut case against this declaratory ruling. But even if it were lawful, using E-rate for school bus Wi-Fi would not necessarily be prudent. 
In fact, I believe it would still be wasteful and unlikely to benefit students and teachers. The federal government already subsidizes mobile internet connections through the ACP and Lifeline programs, and the vast majority of children old enough to use the internet without close supervision already have internet connected smartphones, many with mobile hotspot uh, capability. On top of that, anyone who's ever ridden a school bus should have a healthy skepticism that most children will in fact sit quietly and do homework on their laptops instead of socializing with their friends on the bus and browsing social media on their phones. Now, I personally did extra math practice on the bus, but <laughs> that may have been, I may have been the exception here. That might be what's wrong with me. Okay, so I applaud Senators Cruz, Bud, and Capito for introducing a bill yesterday that would require that schools receiving E-rate funds prohibit children from using school connections to browse social media. I agree with them that the federal government should not have a hand, should not be complicit in giving children harmful access to social media without parental supervision. But as the sponsors of the bill make very clear, passage of the bill would not remedy the unlawfulness and wastefulness of the school bus Wi-Fi program. Instead of pursuing illegal expansions of E-rate outside of school classrooms and libraries, the FCC should instead be considering reforms of the E-rate program to combat waste, fraud, and abuse, and to simplify its administration. One such reform, a federally run competitive bidding portal that will allow us to better enforce E-rate's competitive bidding rules, is currently languishing before the commission. And I encourage the chairwoman to bring a final order implementing it to a commission vote. So I'm unable to support this item. Thank you. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. High-speed broadband access is an essential part of students learning in the 21st century. I happen to agree with Chairman Wheeler that a classroom is wherever learning occurs. School campuses, academic buildings, football fields, parking lots, picnic tables, and school buses. More so, the pandemic highlighted the fact that no longer is connectivity merely necessary for educational success, it is required for education, period. Today's declaratory ruling is an important piece of the puzzle to address the needs of students and teachers through the E-rate program. This is an issue of equity. Today, over half the nation's public school students use a school bus to get to school. Students who travel the longest distances are also the ones who are least likely to have reliable, high-speed connectivity at home. Long commutes and lack of connectivity at home can impact academic performance. And communities that are most affected are those that have been historically underserved, rural, tribal, black, brown, Latino communities. I am grateful for the chairwoman for her leadership on closing the homework gap, and also thank the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau for their work on the declaratory ruling. It has my support. Thank you, commissioners. For more than two decades, the E-rate program at the FCC has helped connect school classrooms and libraries to high-speed modern communications. It got its start as part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which really sounds like a long time ago now. But since that time, the E-rate program has been a quiet powerhouse. It has helped support broadband in schools and libraries in urban America, rural America, and everything in between. But great programs do not thrive without continuous attention and care. We need to make sure E-rate meets the moment and keeps doing good. That's what led me to Vermont last week, where I joined Senator Welch. Now, the Green Mountain State is something to behold in the fall but I wasn't there to take in the leaves and the seasonal vistas. I was there to visit Williamstown, a rural town with a school up in the hills. Now this is an area of the country where students, like so many in remote communities, spend a lot of time on a school bus. Lots of them ride an hour to get to class in the morning and then ride an hour again back home at the end of the day. It is also an area where broadband connections can be sparse. But so much schoolwork today depends on students having access to the internet, not just in class, but at home. And the students who have no broadband at home fall into the homework gap. They struggle with nightly assignments because they lack the connections they need to succeed in school. The school in this little town in Vermont decided they were going to do something about it. They got support to outfit their school buses with Wi-Fi. For their rural students, they decided to turn ride time into connected time for homework. Call it Wi-Fi on wheels. It was something to see. 
But what stayed with me most from this visit was the story the school librarian told about one of the students. That student had no internet connection at home. So at the end of every school day, she rushed to the library just before the bus left and furiously printed out her assignments, web pages for research, and anything else she needed for homework. She printed stacks of paper day after day because she had no broadband at home. Let's be clear. This is a kid with extraordinary grit, but it shouldn't be this hard. She reminds me of another student I met in rural New Mexico when I was traveling with former Senator Udall. In Hatch, an area known for the chilies that are grown in its dry soil, I spoke with a high school football player. Like that student in Vermont, he did not have broadband at home. And he would head to school on the bus and then take the bus long distances to get to games and then back home again. Because when you are on the football team in a rural area, it can be a long haul just to play neighboring schools. Whenever he returned after playing, it was dark. But he would sit late at night in the pitch black of the school parking lot with a laptop for hours, using the school wireless signal just to do his homework. Senator Lujan took a look at this and joined with Senator Graham to introduce a bill to prod this agency to use the E-rate program to support broadband on school buses. They saw what students in rural communities go through and urged us to help get more kids connected. Today, we answer their call. Today, we make clear that schools can use E-rate funds to outfit school buses with Wi-Fi. This is smart, creative, and consistent with the statute. Section 254 of the Communications Act sets up the E-rate program and specifically provides us with authority to use it for additional services for educational purposes. Moreover, it was two decades ago when President Bush was in the White House that the FCC made a similar decision to support E-rate connections on school buses by supporting cell phones and mobile wireless services for these vehicles. We are just updating it to meet this moment. I'm proud of what we're doing today. We're gonna help close the homework gap and get more kids connected for school. This is especially vital in rural areas where commutes to school are long, and we all know broadband is not always available. It's no wonder then why four rural focused education groups, the National Rural Education Association, the National Rural Education Advocacy Consortium, the Rural School and Community Trust, and organization concerned about rural education have all come out in support of this effort. But they are not alone. The National Education Association has endorsed our approach, as has AASA, COSIN, Shelby, and the ALA. There is good to do here, and they see it clearly. So let's get to it. Further to work on this, I would like to thank Allison Baker, Callie Croker, Kate Dumochelle, Jody Griffin, Gabriella Gross, Trent Harkrader, Sue McNeil, Molly O'Connor, and Janae Schreiber from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Zachary DeLeo from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Alejandro Roark, and Kara Voss from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Melena Barzilai, Michelle Ellison, Richard Mallon, Linda Oliver, and William Richardson from the Office of General Counsel, and Julia McHenry, Mark Montano, Stephen Tolbert, and Alex Yankovich from the Office of Economics and Analytics. We will proceed with a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Dissent. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Dissent. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item three on your agenda is titled Broadband Connectivity and Maternal Health, Implementation of the Data Mapping to Save Moms Lives Act, and will be presented by the Office of General Counsel. Karen Onije, Deputy General Counsel and Chief of Staff, Connect to Health FCC Task Force, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Onije, please proceed. So good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Connect to Health FCC Task Force in the Office of General Counsel is pleased to present for your consideration a notice of inquiry that, if adopted, will solicit public comment on the Commission's work to address the intersection of broadband connectivity and maternal health outcomes through its Mapping Broadband Health in America platform. 
I would like to thank the task force chair and general counsel, Michelle Ellison, for her vision and leadership. I would also like to recognize the cross-disciplinary task force team and other staff in the Office of General Counsel, as well as our colleagues in the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Office of Economics and Analytics for all of their work on this item. We are also indebted to our sister federal agencies for their collaboration and expert insights, particularly the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Health Resources and Services Administration. With me at the table today from the task force are Dr. Ariel Mancuso, our Director of Research and Analytics, and a PhD graduate of the Johns Hopkins Blo Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Dr. David Ahern, Senior Advisor to the Task Force and the Director of Digital Behavioral Health at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and a member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Mancuso will now present the item. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The item before you, if adopted, would allow the Commission to obtain public comment and input with respect to its ongoing efforts to expand, refine, and enhance the Mapping Broadband Health in America platform, specifically its maternal health module. The United States, unfortunately, faces an ongoing maternal health crisis. We are the only developed country with increasing maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity rates. And the picture is far worse for women of color, women living in rural areas, and women from lower income households. According to the latest information from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, most pregnancy-related deaths, in fact, some experts suggest over 80% of pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. Furthermore, access to maternal health care remains a major challenge. But there is hope. Broadband-enabled technologies, services, and solutions can be a critical part of the toolkit in addressing preventable maternal deaths, improving access to maternity care, and promoting health equity. Indeed, many innovations in maternity care rely on access to some form of high-speed internet connection. Broadband, however, is more than just the critical infrastructure for delivering modern health interventions. Prior research by the Connect to Health Task Force found that counties that were more connected tended to have better health, even after controlling for other characteristics of these areas. This suggests that broadband itself is a distinct social determinant of health or one of the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. As such, there is an important role for the FCC in supporting the broadband needs of mothers and their families, healthcare providers, and other caregivers that together comprise the ecosystem of maternity care. Recognizing this critical link, last year, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Data Mapping to Save Moms Lives Act. This act directed the commission to incorporate publicly available data on maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity into the Mapping Broadband Health in America platform within 180 days and in consultation with the director of the CDC. The commission successfully completed implementation of the act last summer, publicly releasing an updated version of the platform in June. This updated platform shown here, now enables users to ask and answer critical questions on broadband and maternal health to identify areas of greatest need. For example, areas where critical telehealth resources should be deployed to help address the maternal health crisis, and areas that are experiencing gaps in maternity care that could be opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship in broadband and health. Since the initial release of the updated mapping platform, the Commission has continued working to further enhance, expand, and refine the platform by incorporating additional data and variables related to maternal health, 
adding new functionalities to help users fully explore the intersection of broadband and maternal health, and improving the user experience. To solicit public input on these efforts, the notice of inquiry, if adopted, would seek comment on additional variables, data, and functionalities for maternal health that the Commission should consider including in the platform. Seek comment on how best to intersect broadband, maternal health, and other social determinants of health to yield actionable insights. Seek comment on how to address limitations with certain maternal health outcomes data while still protecting the privacy and confidentiality of these women and their families. And seek comment on ways the Commission can improve the user experience so that the platform is sufficiently responsive to the varied needs of its users. The NOI would also seek information and comment on current and future broadband-enabled health technologies, solutions, and services for maternal health as well as the range of barriers that prevent access and utilization of these broadband-enabled solutions by women of reproductive age or women receiving postpartum care. And lastly, the NOI would seek comment on potential actions or activities that the Commission could pursue to help improve maternal health outcomes reduce maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity rates, and otherwise address the maternal health crisis. The Connect to Health Task Force recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. <coughs> Commissioner Carr. Thanks. <coughs> uh, for, for those waiting with uh, bated breath to see if I'm going to descend for a third time in a row, what I call the rare uh, bowling the regulatory turkey. I think I just made that up. Um, it's a bowling thing. Uh, I will put you out of your misery, thankfully. No, I'm not dissenting. Uh, in fact, on this one, um, I really do got to give the, the chair a lot of credit. I'll say some of this in my statement as well, but her leadership on this has been important. It's a good issue, uh, and it's one that I'm glad to, to support, so thanks for that. Rockridge County, Virginia uh, sits right in the middle of the Shenandoah Valley. The Allegheny Mountains run just to its west, the Blue Ridge Mountains to its east. The 9,000 or so households in the county are spread across its 600 square miles of forest fields, foothills. Even though I-81 and I-64 both run through the county, it's not immune from the healthcare challenges that are afflicting so many rural areas. One of those challenges is limited access to neonatal care, and thus long drives and limited options for pregnant women, making high-risk pregnancies even more difficult. In July of 2019, I had the privilege of visiting a maternal health care unit there at the Rockbridge Area Health Center. This is a federally qualified health center, and it provides primary care services in that medically underserved rural community, including telehealth and remote patient monitoring services. During my visit, I heard firsthand the challenges of high-risk pregnancies in rural communities due to limited maternal care support, highlighting the need for innovative health care in underserved regions. And this is where telehealth technology is making a difference in providing life-changing access to specialty care without requiring moms-to-be to travel long distances, especially those who face risks and challenges during pregnancy. One remarkable aspect of telehealth is the ability of devices that can track vital signs and fetal activity and send data to expert healthcare providers in real time. This proactive approach enables early identification of complications, potentially saving lives and reducing the burden on mothers and families alike. Furthermore, telehealth platforms can also provide crucial access to perinatal mental health services, a facet of maternal care that is often overlooked for mothers. Programs like these are why I launched the Connected Care Pilot Program a couple years ago, which is designed to support telehealth and telemedicine programs for underserved populations. I can remember going to, to talk actually with the, the chair, then Commissioner Rose Marshall in her office, and this was one point that she made clear to me, as we stand this up, we have to keep this in mind and look for opportunities. And indeed, the pilot has funded over two dozen maternal health programs like the one I visited in Rockbridge 
county. I think it's something we can be proud of. At the FCC, we can play our part by helping to ensure that expectant and postpartum mothers receive the care they need regardless of their geographical location. The integration of data to gain a deeper understanding of the nexus between broadband and maternal health is critical. The FCC's mapping and broadband health in America platform will help enable further insight into maternal mortality and morbidity rates as it relates to broadband access. I'm glad that the NOI before us seeks comment on ways to improve that platform. So again, I want to extend a special thanks to Chairwoman Rosenworcel for her leadership and commitment to advancing the interests of maternal health. And I want to thank the staff of the Office of General Counsel, Wireline Bureau, and those before us today on the task force. That is a really loud air conditioner, by the way. Uh, for these important issues, the item has my support. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'll have a longer statement for the record, but for the past two decades, the number of pregnancy-related deaths worldwide has been in steady decline. Consistent with advancements at the intersection of healthcare and technology have boosted maternal health globally. Startling though, startlingly, as we heard uh, Dr. mention, the United States stands alone as the industrialized nation outside of this trend. So in stark contrast to those fellow nations, maternal mortality rates in the U.S. continue to increase. I would also be remiss if I didn't point out, as we heard that evidence shows that this crisis disproportionately uh, puts black and brown and vulnerable uh, mothers at even greater risk, potentially two to three times more susceptible to pregnancy-related deaths. But this is not, of course, to be segmented as an issue for certain people of race, class, socioeconomic status. Let me be clear, our nation's women deserve better. So where's the FCC's role here? As we've heard, the data shows that virtual care like telehealth can really help. And that's where the FCC comes in. Our mapping broadband health in America platform has been drawing the intersection between broadband access and health outcomes. Since its creation in 2016, Congress smartly passed this legislation, signed by President Biden, to save moms' lives, including directing us here at the FCC to enhance this platform by incorporating data on maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. And the platform is now a clear guide uh, as to where maternal health deserts and communities lacking broadband overlap. Um, this publicly available platform provides a treasure trove of data. How do we refine it, expand it, leverage it to help those in need? Those are the questions we rightfully ask today in this NOI. I look forward to hearing from experts um, uh, as well on the ways that we can not only improve the user experience of our health mapping platform, but how to use this data, really use it here at the FCC to reach unconnected communities where they are and provide them the resources that they need. As many of you know, I come from a family full of doctors, uh, including one that is um, an OBGYN. Uh, and so I've focused on the benefits of telehealth, how broadband facilitates technology that has the potential to uh, improve health outcomes. And so I applaud my colleagues, applaud the chairwoman uh, and her, her consistent work here. Of course, I'd like to thank Senators Rosen, Young, Fisher, Schatz, Congressman Bill Rackus, Congresswoman uh, Lisa Blunt Rochester on their bipartisan effort in passing the Data Mapping to Save Moms Lives Act. Thank you as well to the General Counsel for her consistent and steady work here that has just truly been um, a, 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 a great benefit to have your leadership here. Thank you to the doctors for your help uh, on, on, on the task force. Uh, a special note here as well, uh, thank you to the hard work of my dear friend, former uh, Congressman G.K. Butterfield, mm -hmm. who uh, uh, took this issue up uh, and really took it hard. This legislation has been a long time in coming, has my full support. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the staff and the members of the task force for their work on this item, and it has my support. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. Um, I agree with everyone who has spoken thus far. Uh, the increase in maternal mortality and morbidity in our nation is devastating, complex, and a multifaceted issue. And I'm glad that Congress asked the commission to do our part. 
So I congratulate the FCC's Connect to Health Task Force for acting quickly to incorporate important information about maternal health into the Mapping Broadband Health in America platform. Thank you for your valuable work. Now, of course, we get peer review and community feedback. And I would like to encourage all local organizations working on the ground to provide, to provide health care and support to mothers and pregnant individuals to reach out to us, especially the organizations providing care in historically underserved communities, the mothers who most bear the brunt of death during pregnancy. We want to hear from you. Look at the Mapping Broadband Health in America platform and tell us how the data are useful to your efforts. Are we missing data? Do we need to display them differently? How can we improve the platform to inform your everyday work? And to local, state, and tribal policymakers, how can these data inform your broadband deployment decisions? Can they help you address maternal health and outcomes at home? We are here to listen, to learn, and improve, and we need your feedback. I wholeheartedly support this item. Thank you, commissioners. You know, in the nearly nine decades that the FCC has been in existence, I have the distinct honor of being the first woman to permanently lead this agency. I'm also the first mother to run this agency. I'm totally proud of these firsts, but I'm keenly aware that when it comes to female leadership and valuing the lives of women in this country, we still have work to do. Nowhere is this more apparent than in our treatment of maternal mortality. The United States is the only industrialized country with a rising level of maternal mortality. And deaths from pregnancy-related causes strike women of color and those who live in rural communities especially hard. This is a crisis. It demands our attention. It requires everyone to identify how they can help because so many studies show that most pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. And what's more, access to broadband-enabled solutions like telehealth can play a role in improving maternal outcomes. That is why earlier this year we used authority under the Data Mapping to Save Moms Lives Act to update the agency's Mapping Broadband Health America platform to include maternal health data. Now, historically, this platform is focused on how broadband connectivity impacts chronic diseases like diabetes and smoking-related illness, access to medical, dental, or mental health care, and deaths from opioid or drug use. Now it includes data points on maternal mortality, severe maternal morbidity, maternal age, and access to maternal care. When you combine this information with data on broadband access and adoption, it allows you to identify areas where we can promote telemedicine to improve outcomes in maternal health, and areas where broader deployment is needed to support care for those who are pregnant. This updated platform is an important tool to ensure we use it to its full potential. We are initiating this inquiry. That's because we know there is more we can do with this data so that it provides policymakers, healthcare professionals, and groups advocating for better outcomes for mothers with information that can help save lives. If there are ways this data can further assist efforts to address the maternal health care crisis, we want to know. Above all, we want to offer our support, because take it from a mother, the current state of maternal mortality in this country is unacceptable. Thank you to those who champion this effort. Let me start with the folks in Congress, and that includes Senator Rosen, Senator Fisher, Senator Young, Senator Schatz, Representative Bill Rackus, Representative Blunt Rochester, and former Representative Butterfield. Thank you also to the agency's Connect to Health Task Force Chair, Michelle Ellison, for leading our efforts to improve this mapping resource, as well as David Ahern, Ben Bartolome, Terry Cavanaugh, Michael Gibbons, Irene Lai, Karen Onije, Marcus Mayer, Ariel Mancuso, Richard Mallon, Braden Parker, Anjali Singh, Elliot Tarloff, and Shin Yu of the Office of General Counsel. Allison Baker, Brian Boyley, Jody Griffin, and Clint Heifel of the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Pat Brogren, Julia McHenry, Steve Rosenberg, Emily Talaga, and Alex Yankovich of the Office of Economics and Analytics. We will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. 
The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, we're halfway there, so please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item four on your agenda is titled Unlicensed Use of the 6 Gigahertz Band, Expanding Flexible Use in Mid-Band Spectrum Between 3.7 and 24 Gigahertz, and it will be presented by the Office of Engineering and Technology. And Ron Rapazzi, Chief of the Office, will give the introduction. We've reached that point in the uh, proceeding <laughs> where Commissioner Carr is sharing his children's snacks Our with everyone. Snacks and granola bars, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, back to the six gigahertz ban. Mr. Rapazzi, please proceed. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. I'm pleased to introduce a second report and order, second further notice of proposed rulemaking and memorandum opinion and order that will create new opportunities for unlicensed use of the 5925 to 7125 megahertz band or six gigahertz band. This item enables a new class of very low power and licensed devices to operate in the six gigahertz band, building upon the commission's earlier six gigahertz band decisions that have helped to usher in the next generation of Wi-Fi. Today's item would promote more intensive use of the band for unlicensed operations, particularly supporting the growth of the Internet of Things ecosystem. With me at the table are Ira Keltz, Deputy Chief of OET, Hugh Ventile, Electronics Engineer in OET's Policy and Rule, uh, Rules Division, and Nicholas Aros, Deputy Chief of the Policy and Rules Division, who will present the item. Nick? Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Commission's rules for the six gigahertz span which spans the frequency range from 5925 megahertz to 7125 megahertz, currently permit two types of unlicensed devices. Standard power unlicensed devices, which operate under the control of an automated frequency coordination system, and low power indoor devices, which operate at a lower power in, than the standard power devices and are restricted to indoor use. In this second report and order, we add a third type of unlicensed operations to the six gigahertz band, very low power unlicensed devices. Very low power devices will operate at reduced power levels compared to low power indoor devices in two portions of the six gigahertz band, totaling 850 megahertz of spectrum. Very low power devices will be optimal for providing extremely high connection speeds over short distances to enable exciting new applications such as wearable devices, Internet of Things devices, and augmented reality and virtual reality that will help businesses enhance learning opportunities, advance healthcare opportunities, and bring new entertainment experiences. The further notice proposes to expand the capabilities of very low power devices by opening the remainder of these uh, remaining 350 megahertz of the 6 gigahertz band to these devices. It also proposes to provide very low power devices with increased power if they are under the control of a geofencing system, which will prevent them from operating at locations where interference may occur to licensed incumbents with which they share the 6 gigahertz band spectrum. The memorandum, opinion, and order addresses a remaining issue that was remanded to the Commission from a court challenge of the previously adopted 6 gigahertz unlicensed rules. The Office of Engineering, Engineering and Technology recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear comments from the bench. We'll begin with Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much. In 2020, the FCC took a historic step to advance U.S. leadership in wireless. Back then, we led the world in opening up the full 6 gigahertz band for next generation unlicensed use. By doing so, we effectively increased the amount of mid-band spectrum available for Wi-Fi by almost a factor of five. And by acting early, our 2020 decision ensured that Americans and the businesses that are based here on our shores would benefit from this country's first mover advantage. 
The results speak for themselves as consumers here are now benefiting from better, faster Wi-Fi, other unlicensed, and 5G services in their home. The truth is that our action in 6 gigahertz was part of a broader and forward-leaning approach to Spectrum. All told, from 2017 to 2020, the FCC Spectrum efforts opened up more than 6 gigahertz of Spectrum for licensed 5G services, in addition to thousands of megahertz of unlicensed Spectrum. Now, none of these decisions were easy, but they were all important, and for some pretty core reasons. For one, America's leadership in wireless is vital to our geopolitical leadership. When America goes first, the world takes notice. When we free up spectrum, other countries follow suit. And we're clear about the goals that we have set in wireless. It puts the wind at the backs of US officials and our allied stakeholders that are working in international settings to ensure that spectrum bands and technologies develop in ways that work for America's interests and not those of foreign governments and delegations that do not share our values or goals. And that's why I argued in early 2021 for the FCC to keep acting on spectrum matters with the same pace and urgency that we did during my first four years on the job. In fact, I put out a spectrum calendar back then in March of 21 that would ensure that America stays on track and keeps leading the world in wireless. One of the actions I outlined was for the FCC to act that year on authorizing very low power or VLP devices in the full six gigahertz band. <coughs> VLP operations, after all, can unlock even more innovative operations from wearables to augmented and virtual reality. Unfortunately, the FCC didn't act on VLP for over two years until today, um, and that delay has consequences. Again, the the U.S. was first to act on 6 gigahertz back in 2020. But in the meantime, something like 50 countries not only caught up to us by authorizing unlicensed operations in 6, but they moved faster than us on authorizing VLP in the band. I think it's critical for the U.S. that we start leaning in again on our leadership on wireless. Now, I'm very glad that we are unanimous in taking action today in six gigahertz in a way that authorizes VLP operations. I know there's some over the years that have tried to get the FCC to, to backtrack on that issue here, and, and to them I say, that's not happening. <laughs> uh, if anything, I think we need to continue to move forward um, with more unlicensed permissions in the six gigahertz band. And that's why I would have been happy to go even further in today's decision than we do right now. For instance, I would have prefer the FCC to address higher power levels now for low power indoor or LPI devices. I would prefer to move now on authorizing additional power for VLP. And I would have preferred authorizing VLP operations in additional portions of the six gigahertz band today. After all, I think acting on those issues now would have been entirely consistent with both the DC Circuit's 2021 decision in the six gigahertz band as well as our own spectrum policy statement. It also would have continued to show strong spectrum leadership, which is going to continue to aid U.S. efforts as we head into next month's World Radio Conference in Dubai. I think this is a good one to pocket heading into there. So while the U.S. has been moving more slowly on spectrum as of late, I'm confident that we can get things back on track. One reason is the FCC's talented and dedicated staff right here. They worked hard on this decision. And there's no doubt at all that it tackles and solves some very complex technical matters. So I'm, I'm very appreciative for their work, for the chair bringing this forward. The order has my support. I approve. <coughs> Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. We opened the 6 gigahertz ban to unlicensed devices at a unique moment in American history. It was April of 2020. Wi-Fi had emerged as a lifeline of connectivity in places like libraries, restaurants, parking lots, youth centers. Internet usage had morphed and surged, sparking a new sense of urgency to ensure that our networks, including our home networks, 
could keep pace with demand, and at the same time, new waves of IoT in innovation began to grip sectors like healthcare, transportation, and so consumer adoption also began to climb as newer and more affordable devices offered fresh ways to make life safer, more convenient, more enriching, and more efficient. On all these fronts, six gigahertz on license showed a vibrant path forward from the wide area to the local area to the interconnectivity immediately around us. And so that's why when we adopted our 2020 order, I spoke about the PAN's potential to serve as a linchpin for those more innovative, more inclusive wireless future. I continue to share that vision for six gigahertz and today's action takes another important step towards achieving that. Wearable devices, in, for example, stand at the very leading edge of wireless innovation. They can power applications for everyday users, for educators, medical professionals, gamers too. But in 2023, consumers don't want and shouldn't have to put up with devices that are wired clunky, sluggish, or that overheat or need constantly to recharge. With VLP, they can benefit from products that are more capable, sleeker, more power efficient, and that cost less and just plain work better. And so this has been a long time coming. I'm glad we got it done ahead of, as was mentioned, uh, the World Radio Conference. Countries around the world are exploring the future of six gigahertz within their borders. Today's action shows the promise of six unlicensed. It goes well beyond the millions of just Wi-Fi 6E devices that have shipped already and will only continue to build as the ecosystem matures and develops. And so the incumbents in this ban provide vital services, making sure we protect their operations is critical. And that's why we've taken this uh, conservative first step with VLP power levels as we continue to build the record for future possibilities. And speaking on that issue, I hope we do continue to explore our limits for low power indoor devices and that we do so quickly. As I said in 2020, raising power can help ensure that people can connect to Wi-Fi throughout their homes without additional equipment that might be too costly or too complicated for everyday Americans. And so it can help make six gigahertz networks less expensive as well to deploy for small businesses. The potential consumer impact here is big and it's real. The engineering, of course, is not easy. So thank you all for your hard work. The time has come for us to work through those uh, questions that remain, see if we can come up with the right solutions. But thank you to OET and thank you to the chair for continuing to push ahead. It will have my strong support. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. Well, I support today's item. I would be remiss if I did not express my reservations about how the second report and order dismisses technical arguments made by certain commenters. The analysis within the second report and order is thorough and well-reasoned based upon the data and simulations it relies upon, the San Francisco and Houston simulations completed by Apple and Broadcom et al. But what concerns me about today's item is that it does not give adequate consideration to many of the arguments made by commentators who raise concerns about lack of access to crucial data that informs those simulations and the potential for harmful interference to their operations from unlicensed VLP devices. I fear that without a thorough deliberation of licensed and common substantive technical arguments, the Commission may be failing to anticipate instances of harmful interference from VLP devices. And if my fears bear fruit, the Commission could find itself in the position of attempting to police interference rights in a heavily, heavily congested environment where it proves difficult, if not impossible, to enforce its rules. If 6 gigahertz licensees are unable to identify the source of the interference, they will be unable to file a complaint with sufficient information to allow Commission staff to conduct any enforcement. Now, uh, well, I am pleased that the chairwoman addressed my concerns by including additional language about rules enforcement and equipment certification for VLP devices, we should nevertheless proceed with caution. We must carefully consider, through the proceeding tied up in the second further notice, what additional steps can or should be taken to mitigate the potential for harmful interference. We must be prepared just in case it turns out that the simulations are in certain instances wrong and harmful interference is caused by the proliferation of the VLP devices approved of in today's second report and order. And as always, thank you to the OET staff for fantastic work. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today we achieved two important interrelated goals. 
Nationally, we demonstrate the continued implementation of the FCC's historic 2020 decision to dedicate 1,200 megahertz of mid-band spectrum to unlicensed innovation. And internationally, we send a powerful message about the United States' continued commitment to next-generation Wi-Fi operations in the 6 gigahertz band in advance of the 2023 World Radio Communication Conference. I want to thank the Office of Engineering and Technology for their hard work on this item. With these decisions, we support innovation at home, and we uphold our leadership internationally. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. You know, our lives, they run on unlicensed spectrum. Just think about that laptop you pulled open this morning to check your email, the baby monitor you might have used to keep tabs on your child at night, the fitness tracker you use to count your steps, or the tunes you stream over your phone to power you through a workout. No matter who you are or where you live, the odds are good that all sorts of activities in your day-to-day -day life depend on wireless airwaves that are unlicensed. Unlicensed spectrum is an invisible force. It contributes more than $95 billion to our economy every year. It helps makes our lives more convenient, more connected, and more productive. And this is no accident. It was the result of wireless policy choices that were made by the FCC more than three decades ago. Our engineers challenged the status quo by suggesting that spectrum that was not licensed to specific individuals could be useful for all. So the FCC opened a handful of underused frequencies, airwaves that were widely viewed as garbage bands, to anyone who followed some basic technical rules. What followed was revolutionary. We made it possible to access airwaves without licenses, to innovate without permission, and to develop low power wireless technologies that have changed the way we live and work. But the best known development from this effort was Wi-Fi, because unlicensed airwaves are the spectrum where Wi-Fi was born. The challenge now is to keep this good stuff growing. So a few years ago, when the global pandemic put our Wi-Fi routers center stage, the FCC determined it was vital to identify additional spectrum to carry our unlicensed wireless activity, and we set aside a large swath of airwaves in the six gigahertz band. This was the right thing to do. Because as fiber, cable, and commercial wireless move to gigabit speeds, we need to ensure our Wi-Fi connections have the wider channels and additional bandwidth they need to keep pace. Today, we take the effort to support unlicensed activity in the 6 gigahertz band even further. We are opening up 850 megahertz of the 6 gigahertz band to small mobile devices operating at very low power while putting in place common sense safeguards to protect incumbent uses. We are also proposing to open up an additional 350 megahertz of the 6 gigahertz band for very low power devices. That means we are expanding access to the 6 gigahertz band to help jumpstart the next generation of unlicensed wireless devices. So get ready. Because we have now the unlicensed bandwidth with a terrific mix of high capacity and low latency that's going to deliver new immersive real-time applications. That means these are the airwaves where we can develop new wearable technologies and expand access to augmented and virtual reality. In other words, these are the airwaves where the future happens, and with the 6 gigahertz band, the United States is leading the way. Thank you to the staff responsible for this effort, and it was a big effort. And that includes Bodman Bayapur, Jamie Coleman, Navid Goshani, Michael Ha, Ira Keltz, Paul Murray, Nick Oris, Barbara Pavon, Jameson Prime, Ron Rapazzi, Hugh Van Tile, and Elol Wickensell from the Office of Engineering and Technology, Steve Buzanow, Kamrad Edamad, John Lambert, and Janet Young from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Deborah Broderson and Keith McCrickard from the Office of General Counsel, Catherine Matraves and Patrick Sun from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Matthew Gibson and Kathy Harvey from the Enforcement Bureau, Brian Marenko and Michael Willem from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Sean Yun from the Media Bureau. And with that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. All right. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Special thank you to OET for your work on this. Madam Secretary, will you please announce the next item on today's agenda?
Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item five on your agenda is titled Support for Alaska Connectivity and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Trent Hargrader, Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, will give the introduction. Ah, it's the third time's the charm. You're doing it differently. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Mr. Harkrader, please proceed. I feel like it's always smarter to sit as close to Michelle as possible. <laughs> and you, and you, know the, you know the the agency's chief lawyer wants to have me, have me at like arm's length. Um, thank you again. Good morning. I think it's still morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau are pleased to present for your consideration a notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks comment on the Alaska Connect Fund, the next phase of high cost support that continues the Commission's commitment to providing universal service fund support in Alaska for both fixed and broadband carriers. The item also includes a report in order that will improve the efficiency and administration of the high cost program. I would like to thank the staff in the Office of Economics and Analytics for their work on this item, as well as staff from the Broadband Data Task Force, Office of General Counsel, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Office of Native Affairs and Policy, and the Office of Communications Business Opportunities for their contributions. And I know it goes without saying because they're already up here, but there was a crucial contribution to this item that we would not be able to do without our friends in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Um, with me at the table are Suzanne Yellen, Associate Chief in the Wireline Bureau, Jody Griffin, who's the Division Chief in TAPD, Jesse Jackman, uh, who's Deputy, Ch Deputy Chief in TAPD, Rebecca Douglas, Attorney Advisor in the Bureau's TAPD as well. From Wireless, we have Barbara Esmond, Deputy Bureau Chief, and Matt Warner, Attorney Advisor in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau Competition and Infrastructure Policy Division. Rebecca and Matt are gonna take this uh, as a twofer, so I'm gonna throw it to Rebecca first. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. At the notice of proposed rulemaking we present today, if adopted, would seek comment on how best to continue providing high-cost support for fixed broadband service in Alaska. Alaskan carriers face unique circumstances that make deployment and maintenance of fixed voice and broadband-capable networks challenging. For this reason, the Commission has previously targeted high-cost funding to Alaska through the Alaska Plan and other programs. While progress has been made based on broadband data collection information as of December 2022, Alaska still ranks 55th of 56 states and territories for broadband availability. The support terms of the current FCC funding mechanisms targeting Alaska are scheduled to end over the next few years. This notice would seek comment on how best to continue providing high cost support for fixed broadband service in Alaska, including how changes in technology, broadband availability, and other federal funding for broadband deployment in Alaska should inform the structure and requirements of the Alaska Connect Fund. The notice also seeks comment on when the Alaska Connect Fund should begin, eligible areas and providers, and developing a competitive process for determining support amounts. The item would also seek comment on the appropriate term of support, minimum speed, latency, and data usage requirements, adjustments to the Alaska-specific reasonably comparable rate benchmarks, and conditioning support on the offering of a low-cost plan. In addition, the item would seek comment on tribal consent requirements and remaining barriers for tribal nations in Alaska. I now turn the presentation over to Matt Warner from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau to present the items discussion of Alaska Connect Fund mobile support. Thank you, Rebecca. The mobile wireless section of the notice seeks comment on ways the Commission can ensure Alaskans in remote areas have access to reliable and secure mobile service. The 2016 Alaska Plan froze high cost support, high cost support levels for eight mobile providers in remote areas of Alaska in exchange for commitments to extend 4G LTE, subject to exceptions, to the high cost eligible areas they were serving. These efforts have helped bring 4G LTE to over 50,000 Alaskans. However, over 70,000 Alaskans in remote areas still lack access to mobile broadband at speeds of at least five megabits per second download and one megabit per second upload. Further, these areas have little to no 5G and R, which is the generation of technology the Commission is considering as a standard for support of high-cost mobile wireless deployment. 
Therefore, there is still a need for continued funding to ensure Alaskans in remote areas have access to advanced mobile services. The notice seeks comment on ways an Alaska Connect Fund could modernize providing mobile support to remote parts of Alaska, including ways to bring 5G and R to these areas. In particular, the notice seeks comment on how to determine eligible areas and services for mobile support for the Alaska Connect Fund, taking into account the improved maps and coverage and availability data obtained through the broadband data collection. Consistent with the broadband data collection, this item proposes use of the H3 hexagonal, hexagonal geospatial indexing system to identify the areas eligible for high cost support, similar to the approach the commission is considering for the 5G fund. In addition, the notice seeks comment on how the current program can be improved and updated, including how to determine mobile provider eligibility, how funds should be distributed, and how to ensure carrier accountability for the services funded through the Alaska Connect Fund. Rebecca will now provide a brief overview of the items report in order. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. The items report in order, if adopted, would make administrative improvements to the high cost program generally. These changes include the elimination of unnecessary filing requirements and improved alignment of reporting deadlines, grace periods, and support reductions. The report in order would improve commission oversight of the high cost program by increasing performance testing reporting, creating a process to accept late reported locations, eliminating waiver exceptions for study area boundary changes, and establishing a notice requirement for carriers relinquishing ETC designations. Finally, the report in order would clarify and streamline the processes governing mergers of rate of return local exchange carriers. The bureaus recommend adoption of this item and request editorial privileges. Thank you both. We'll now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much to the team for the work on this. I know, uh, like all of us on the commission, we spent a lot of time up in Alaska. I reminded uh, last summer I was up uh, in the Matsu Valley, not too far from Palmer. Alaska, and I had the chance to spend time with a, a construction crew that was uh, led by this guy, Brad. They were putting in new fiber into a community that before that had only had 1980s uh, DSL. And that was just one of the many infrastructure projects that are successful in Alaska today, thanks to the 2016 Alaska Plan. We're seeing a lot of benefits beyond that as well throughout the state, as many of us have seen on our travels. Um, and so I'm glad that we're seeking comment today on how we can extend some of those wins for another period of years. Obviously, build cycles uh, are short, planning periods are long, um, and so it's important that we give certainty as quickly as possible to Alaska. So I'm really glad that the chairs brought this forward um, and that we're moving forward with this item. And obviously, you always um, can't let Alaska go by without uh, saying thanks to, to uh, Senator Sullivan and his team who've been leading the way to make sure that um, Alaska uh, it's treated fairly by the FCC, and I think moving quickly on this is a, is a piece of that. So thanks again to the team for the work on this. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'll have a longer statement. Um, but yes, as was mentioned, I, I visited Alaska earlier this year in June. Uh, saw a school in the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, Peninsula um, uh, saw fiber being laid as well. Uh, visited Oscarville and saw the unique uh, a aspect of trying to provide connectivity to a village of 80. Uh, and that truly kind of defines, you know, some low populations, but uh, grand spaces there, of course, that they have there in Alaska are part of the unique challenge. Uh, one thing that I will highlight uh, from, my, from my longer statement is I am glad today that we're asking questions on how to support broadband going forward in a world, of course, where Alaska was allocated over a billion dollars in BEAD. Uh, and so we need to ensure uh, that our precious Universal Service Fund dollars uh, are, are, are not duplicative, of course, of that very significant hand-in-glove fit that we're working on with our sister agency over there at NTIA. And so uh, the notice does ask the right questions uh, here as well. Middle mile support, role of direct-to-home satellite broadband, public interest obligations. I'm also glad to see um, we're asking those questions about tribal consent. I think that's incredibly important there in Alaska, uh, as well as, um, uh, in addition, something that I've highlighted on a number of items, and that is adoption and, and maintenance of operational cybersecurity and supply chain risk man management plans. I, I firmly feel, and, and, and um, uh, you know, say again, that networks built uh, with federal funds should be secure. Uh, and so this notice is a strong step forward. It has my support, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you to the team for the hard work here with Alaska. Yes. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. 
So I had an opportunity to take a, tr a trip up to Alaska with Senator Sullivan and Commissioner Carr as well, and you know that was a great opportunity for me to see firsthand how challenging and it can be to live in some parts of Alaska, and how much people there benefit from whatever internet connectivity they can get. FCC programs make a big difference to them, and I'm happy to, su to support this notice of proposed rulemaking for the future of high-cost support in Alaska. I'm also happy to support the order, streamlining and reforming other aspects of our high-cost uh, high cost programs. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. I echo my colleague's statements. Alaska is unique. Alaska is unique because of the many reasons my colleagues just noted, geography, size, rurality, remoteness. But Alaska is also unique because of its rich culture and long history of storytelling. As Alaska's Internet for All plan notes, without reliable, affordable, high-speed connectivity, this rich culture is in danger of being lost. And while areas in Alaska are some of the most remote and hardest to serve in the country, too much is at stake if we do not connect these communities. That is why I support today's item. The Commission has long recognized the importance and uniqueness of deploying high-speed connectivity in Alaska, to Alaska. Now, armed with our lessons learned from the past seven years, advancements in technology, and unprecedented investment, we have the opportunity to thoughtfully and efficiently determine the best ways that universal service funds can support the next phase of broadband support in Alaska. I look forward to a substantial record in this proceeding and to working together with the Alaska delegation, as well as my colleagues, to support affordable, reliable connectivity for Alaskans. Many thanks to the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunication Bureau, Telecommunications Bureau, and the Office of Economics and Analytics for their work on this item. Thank you, commissioners. We are on a mission here to connect everyone everywhere in this country to high-speed broadband. And that includes Alaska. And like many of my colleagues, I have spent time awed by the vastness of the state, traveling off-road both above and below the Arctic Circle. I'm going to spare you my stories, including the ones involving my considerable deep-sea fishing exploits. I'm also going to spare you the rest of my statement and an interest in having us move along. But I yeah. do want to thank the really extraordinary team, and it's a big one that pulled this effort together to make sure that we have service for the digital age in the 49th state. So let me just call out the staff who worked on this effort. Theodore Burmeister, Rebecca Douglas, Lynn Engeldow, Jody Griffin, Trent Harkrader, Jesse Jackman, Katie King, Nissa Longer, Dankoya Nguyen, Nicholas Page, Divya Shinoy, Haley Steffen, Gil Strobel, and Suzanne Yellen from the Wireline Competition Bureau, Barbara Espin, Gustav Gilmark, Garnett Hanley, Susanna Larson, Kaylee Lanter, John Lockwood, Wesley Plan, Joel Tabenblatt, and Matthew Warner from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Craig Bomberger, Patrick Brogan, Matthew Collins, Judith Dempsey, James Eisner, Peter Gingaleski, John Hanman, Michael Jansen, Eugene Kiselev, Richard Kaiwakowski, Ken Lynch, Catherine Matraves, Mark Montano, Eric Ralph, Michelle Schaefer, Martha Stansdell, Don Stockdale, Craig Troop, Emily Talaga, and Shane Taylor from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Ed Bartholome and Kim Anishkaret from the Broadband Data Task Force, James Wiley from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Megan Ingrisio, Jeremy Marcus, Ryan McDonald, Patrick McGrath, and Victoria Rendazzo of the Enforcement Bureau, Derek Goatson and Bambi Kraus from the Office of Native Affairs and Policy, Kara Voth from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Marlena Barzilai, Doug Klein, Rick Mallon, and Keith McCricker from the Office of General Counsel, and Mike Gusso, Jocelyn James, and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. We will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approved. Commissioner Starks. Approved. Commissioner Symington. Approved. Commissioner Gomez. Approved. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, we're almost there. Please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item six, the final item on your agenda, is titled Improving Wireless Emergency Alerts and will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Austin Rondazzo, Associate Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Rondazzo, please proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. 
Today we present a report in order designed to improve the accessibility and effectiveness of wireless emergency alerts, which notify the public about emergencies on their mobile devices. Emergency managers across the country rely on this public safety tool to protect their communities during disasters, to help recover missing children, and to convey other life-saving information. For wireless emergency alerts to remain effective, the public must be able to understand the alerts they receive, and emergency managers must be able to understand the extent to which the alerts are, are available to their communities. Now to present today's item. With me today from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau is Michael Antonino, Attorney Advisor in the Bureau's Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division. I would like to thank the Bureau staff who worked on this item, as well as the other bureaus and offices that contributed. Now to Mr. Antonino, who will present the item. Thank you, Associate Chief Randazzo. Good afternoon, Chairwoman uh, Rosenworcel and Commissioners. Today's report and order seeks to improve the accessibility and transparency of wireless emergency alerts, otherwise known as WIA. First, the report and order requires participating wireless providers to support multilingual WIA using message templates translated into the 13 most commonly spoken languages in the United States, in addition to English and American Sign Language. Participating wireless providers will support multilingual WIA by enabling mobile devices to display message templates that would be pre-installed and stored on the mobile device itself. Second, to help the public to personalize emergency alerts, the report and order requires participating wireless providers to support the inclusion of location-aware maps in WIA messages that show the alert recipient's location relative to the geographic area where the emergency is occurring. Third, the report and order seeks to facilitate more effective WIA performance and public awareness testing by enabling alerting authorities to send two localized WIA tests per year that the public receives by default provided that the alerting authority takes steps to ensure that the public is aware that the test is in fact only a test. Finally, the report and order establishes a commission-hosted WIA database. Using this database, wireless providers will be required to refresh their election of whether or not to participate in WIA, and for those who choose to participate, to provide information about the extent to which they make WIA available in their wireless service area and on the mobile devices that they sell. This will improve alerting authorities and the public's awareness of the extent to which WIA is available in their respective communities. The Bureau recommends adoption of this report and order and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thank you uh, so much to the team for all the work on this item. Uh, it has my support. Thanks. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Wildfires in Hawaii, severe storms in Illinois, Mississippi, and Vermont, typhoons in Guam, flooding in Alaska, hurricanes Franklin, Idalia, and Lee. A quick look at FEMA's alerts over just the last few months starkly illustrates the number of extreme weather events that our country is facing. And while natural disasters may be the first emergencies that come to mind, when we think of uh, the wireless emergency alert system, federal, state, local alerting authorities also use uh, WIA for evacuate, shelter in place alerts, AMBER alerts, other emergency messages. And so by definition, in an emergency, time is of the essence. Alert recipients must be able to receive, understand, and act upon WIA messages immediately and too frequently. It is among the most vulnerable members of our communities, including uh, non-English or Spanish speakers and vision uh, or hearing impaired individuals who get left behind. And so I'll have a longer statement for the record, but I am um, uh, deeply glad, grateful, and supportive that we take several important steps today to ensure that not only that we reach them, uh, but we do so in the most efficient and effective manner. Uh, this has my strong support. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I'm happy to support this order that, uh, one, will make sure that more non-English speakers receive timely and actionable alerts in their own languages, and two, will present alert recipients with maps showing their own locations, as well as relevant geographic information about the alert, such as the area subject to a flood warning or tornado watch. I have no doubt that these changes will make a big difference in some people's lives. And thank you for your hard work on this uh, to the staff. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. Today we take significant steps to ensure more people are able to receive life-saving emergency information in the language and format they understand. Among other requirements, we will now require that wireless emergency alerts, as, as you noted, we is, 
are able to reach consumers in 13 languages, languages in American Sign Language, and that a map of the general emergency area be made available to consumers. These steps will help communities have the information they need to save lives. I want to thank the uh, Office of the Chairwoman for incorporating our edits, highlighting the importance of outreach to consumers. One critical step to be able to receive multilingual WIA is to set your phone to your preferred language so that you can receive the alert in that language. We are encouraging all stakeholders to help raise awareness about this critical step and ask the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau to seek co public comment on strategies for such outreach. So please, to all of you tuning in, tell us how we can make information about multilingual WIA more accessible to you. I would like to thank the Bureau for their hard work on this item. And in the spirit of outreach to consumers on the importance of multilingual WIA, I would like now to share my remarks in Spanish. Hoy, la Comisión Federal de Comunicaciones toma medidas importantes para garantizar que más personas puedan recibir información sobre emergencias en su propio idioma. Ahora requeriremos que las alertas de emergencia inalámbricas puedan llegar a los consumidores en 13 idiomas y en la lengua de señas americana, y que los consumidores, consumidores tengan acceso a un mapa del área general de la emergencia. Estas medidas ayudarán a que los consumidores tengan la información necesaria para mantenerse a salvo durante emergencias. Quiero agradecer a la oficina de la presidenta Rosen Wurzel por tomar en cuenta nuestras sugerencias para fomentar el, el conocimiento de las alertas de emergencia entre los consumidores. Por ejemplo, para que usted pueda recibir las alertas en su idioma, es necesario que configure su teléfono en ese idioma. Instamos a todos los grupos interesados a generar conciencia sobre el uso de las alertas de emergencia y solicitamos a la Oficina de Seguridad Pública y Seguridad Nacional de la Comisión Federal de Comunicaciones, that's you, PSH, PSHSB, la realización de una consulta pública para obtener recomendaciones sobre cómo podemos perfeccionar la difusión pública de las alertas de emergencia multilingües. Así que, a quienes nos están escuchando, les quiero decir que estamos abiertos para recibir sus comentarios sobre cómo lograr que la información sobre las alertas de emergencia sea más accesible. También me gustaría agradecer a la Oficina de Seguridad Pública y Seguridad Nacional por su trabajo en este tema. And thank you very much for your good work. Thank you, commissioners. Let me tell just a quick story. On October 4th, I was at Gallaudet University. I spoke at an afternoon class taught by the school's president, Roberta Cordano. It was a session dedicated to understanding policy from the inside out. But as erudite as my remarks were, we had a powerful object lesson in policy making right then and there when the national test of the wireless emergency alert system went off mid-lecture. Students instinctively reached for their phones, not because this community heard their devices, we were at the nation's premier school for the deaf, after all. But because these special alerts have a distinctive vibration, it was a reminder that when we build systems to support public safety, we make policy choices about who we reach and how it can help save lives. Today, we make another choice. We extend the reach of wireless emergency alert system to 13 languages, including American Sign Language. We do this by requiring participating wireless providers to support templates that are based on a system that New York State Attorney General Letitia James brought to our attention following floods caused by Hurricane Ida, where not all residents, especially those speaking Asian languages, got the information they needed for their safety. She pressed us to recognize how expanding multilingual alerting can save lives. We agree, and we are taking action. We are also requiring wireless providers to support location-aware maps so that those who get these alerts have a better sense of precisely where the emergency is occurring. 
On top of that, we are establishing a new database at the FCC to help provide alert originators with more insight into where and to what extent these alerts are available in their communities. Then, with an eye to the future, we announce we're seeking to partner with entities that have the ability to test the delivery of these alerts through technologies like new satellite systems. Why is this so important? Because our alert systems need to be resilient, and in many disasters, terrestrial wireless towers are rendered inoperable. We need alternative solutions, so we turn to space. These are really important changes to the wireless emergency alert system. They are among the most vital reforms we can make under existing law to make sure these warnings reach people when they need them most. But I think the Warning Alert and Response Network Act, which created the wireless emergency alert system and was signed into law in 2008, is starting to show its age. The law was passed just as the smartphone era began. It assumes that the warnings we receive on wireless devices are an afterthought, secondary to those delivered over radio and television through the emergency alert system. As a result, participation in the wireless emergency alert system remains voluntary. These are the devices we have in our palms, pockets, and purses at all times. Every carrier and every device should be capable of receiving these warnings. This should not be voluntary. I think it's time to update the law. For now, though, I want to thank the New York Attorney General who brought this issue to our attention, the students at Gallaudet University who, in real time, made me think about this issue in new ways, and, of course, the staff responsible for this effort, including Nicole McGuinness, Austin Randazzo, Erica Olson, Michael Antonio, Shabir Hamid, James Wiley, David Saratsky, Stephen Carpenter, Rasul Safabian, Rochelle Cohen, and Deborah Jordan from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Garnet Hanley from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Susie Rosen Singleton, and William David Wallace from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Jeremy Marcus from the Enforcement Bureau, Shauna Wilkerson and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Alex Yankovic from the Office of Economics and Analytics, and Douglas Klein, William Huber, and Deborah Broderson from the Office of General Counsel. And with that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. All right. This has been our first meeting with Commissioner Gomez. I like the sound of that. It has probably also been our longest. It is definitely the one where Commissioner Carr ate the most snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Would any of my colleagues like to make announcements at this time? Commissioner Carr. No announcements. Commissioner Starks. Commissioner Symington. Commissioner Gomez. I do have announcements. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I do have some announcements today at my, at my first open meeting as a commissioner. I want to again acknowledge what an honor it is to be sitting here and express my appreciation to you and to my fellow commissioners for all the warm welcome that I have received. This has been quite a first meeting. And I want to note for those watching that I have already started to uh, develop a working, uh, productive working relationships with you, with my fellow commissioners. And everyone should know that while at times we may disagree on policy, it is possible to do so respectfully and with candor. I also want to thank you, Chairwoman, and your staff for all your help and support, including lending me the talented and experienced team to stand up my office that has allowed me to hit the ground running and run we have. Some of you may know that I worked here before. I was almost, uh, it was almost 30 years ago that I came to the commission as a young attorney. I recognized then what a privilege it was as the issues the commission was facing then were incredibly important and complex at the time. And I found my colleagues to be unbelievably smart, thoughtful, hardworking, and truly kind and interesting people, a very young, Jessica Rosenworcel was one of them. Still very young, yes, even younger. I found my home. I am so grateful to have been given the opportunity to come home and again work with all these smart, thoughtful, kind, very good looking, and interesting FCC colleagues and staff on some of the most pressing and consequential issues of our time. 
And I am so happy so, to see so many friendly faces, and I am looking forward to meeting those of you with whom I have not had the chance to work. And now I'd like to introduce my staff. I would like to ask them to stand up, please. Anna Holland. Anna Holland is my acting executive assistant. She comes to us most recently from the Wireline Competition Bureau, where she assisted the bureau chief, and she also brings years of experience from working with prior commissioner's offices and private industry. Anna, who has a wonderful name, <laughs> has been working hard to get my office up and running and to keep us organized and on track. Thank you, Anna. Ejael Casa Peralta. Ejael is my acting legal advisor on wireless, public safety, and consumer matters and comes to my office from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau by way of both the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Office of Media Relations, but I got her. <laughs> Where she has worked at a high level on significant policy and outreach matters. We address a lot of technical and policy issues at the commission, but at bottom, the purpose of what we do is to ensure industry actions benefit and protect consumers. Adele brings a valuable lens to the work along with her considerable strategic and legal skills. Thank you, Adele. Haley Steffen. Haley is my acting legal advisor for Wireline and Space Matters and comes to my office from the Wireline Competition Bureau where she served as legal advisor to the bureau chief for the past two years following a number of years working on universal service issues as a staff attorney. Haley brings her legal and policy analytical skills, knowledge of agency process, good humor, and formidable problem-solving abilities to my team. Thank you. And finally, Dina Shetler. Dina is my acting chief of staff and advisor on media and international issues. I am borrowing Dina from the office of Chairwoman Rosenworcel, and she brings 27 years of FCC experience and a wide range of leadership capacities, both policy and organizational, which means she has been able to help me identify and recruit the right staff advise me on a range of policy issues, represent my views to industry from the outset, and work with agency staff to ensure our refrigerator was fixed in relatively short order. <laughs> Dina and I have worked together previously in various iterations, and I cannot stress enough how grateful I am to be working with her again, as well as with this wonderful staff. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Before we adjourn, I'd like to make a few announcements but first, I want to share the sad news of the passing of two of our FCC colleagues. It's with a heavy heart that I report the passing of a recently retired and much beloved FCC family member, and that's Douglas Slotten. Doug was one of the FCC's longest serving employees. He worked at the agency for more than four decades and devoted his entire life to public service through his military service in Vietnam and his government service at the FCC. Doug's contributions helped shape the telecommunications marketplace and set the stage for the broadband revolution. At the start of his career, AT&T was a monopoly. It was the telephone company, and competition was still very much on the horizon. And Doug was a key contributor to so many landmark orders involving implementation of the commission's access charge regime. He wasn't just an exceptional attorney and civil servant. He was a kind, patient, and selfless teacher. He was always generous with his knowledge and his friendship, and he loved chatting about his twin daughters and also the St. Louis Cardinals. Doug also reminded all of us that life can hold great things, even in the face of challenges. And uh, he will continue to inspire us as long as we hold his memory close. I'm also saddened to report of the passing of Craig Bomberger. Craig joined the commission in 1999, and he worked on a whole bunch of iterations of the auctions division within the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and Office of Economics and Analytics. Most recently, he was our acting auctions division chief. Uh, more importantly, he was a widely admired colleague, manager, and friend. Prior to the FCC, Craig also worked for four years at the US House of Representatives, so really the bulk of his professional life was spent in public service. He grew up in Indiana and received his undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina, which made him a lifelong Tar Heel fan. He would tell anyone that. He went on to receive an advanced degree in public policy from the University of Michigan. And shortly after becoming 
becoming an employee of the commission, he became the chief of the auctions and operations branch. And after that, he married and his wife, Melissa, and he had two daughters. He absolutely adoved his, loved his daughters. If you worked with him, you knew he became an expert on Disney princesses and would talk about how he drove his daughters to countless gymnastic meets. He recently took his oldest daughter to her first year of college at the University of Tennessee. Now, getting to auction is a long process. It's a lot of work, and Craig was one of those people who was always involved. From the mock auction to the final posting of results, he was in that war room we build every step of the way. He coached bidders, he worked closely with the team, and he managed people like myself asking a whole bunch of questions. He decorated the auction war room with lights for the holidays, brought in strange little tabletop creatures, and made his teammates laugh when the pressure was on. He survived by his wife, Melissa, and their two daughters. He will be fondly remembered and missed by his FCC family as well. And then finally, I have a retirement to mention. Sharon Weigel started with the FCC in July of 1977 in Gettysburg. She worked in what was then the Safety and Special Radio Services Bureau as a clerk typist. And while she was in this position, her chief responsibilities included opening the FCC mail. In 1980, she moved to the Private Radio Bureau, then took on new responsibilities. And by 1992, she was a lead document processing clerk in the Private Radio Bureau. And she became a legal instruments examiner in the new Wireless Telecommunications Bureau when it was formed back in 1994. In 1997, Sharon became an industry analyst and remained in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau until the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau was created in 2006. And for the last 17 years, she's been part of the Public Safety Licensing Branch, reviewing Part 90 land mobile applications, and then becoming the Bureau's expert on microwave application processing. If you add it all up, that is more than 46 years at the FCC. So thank you, Sharon. We appreciate your work for the FCC and on behalf of the American people. Madam Secretary, we finally made it. Will you please announce the next date for the Commission's monthly agenda meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. Until then, we stand adjourned. Good afternoon, everyone. If we could please take any outside conversations to the foyer, we'd greatly appreciate it. We want to get our post-open meeting press conference started as soon as possible. So if folks could just take any conversations to the foyer, we'd greatly appreciate it. All right. Hi, I am Paloma Perez, uh, FCC Communications Director now. Sorry, still getting used to the new title. Um, and we will be starting Chairwoman Rosenworcel's post-open meeting press conference. As per usual, I just want to remind folks we generally have a lot about one question per reporter. If you could please introduce yourself, that's always helpful for us. And with that, I welcome Chairwoman Rosenworcel to, to the podium. All right. I know it's been a long morning into the afternoon, but we've really done a lot today. We uh, are starting a rulemaking on net neutrality and broadband oversight. We are addressing the homework gap by making sure that school districts can use E-Rate to put Wi-Fi on buses. We are looking for creative solutions to our nation's maternal mortality crisis. We are expanding on license service in the six gigahertz band. We are making sure the 49th state has the resources it needs to deploy modern communications everywhere in Alaska. And for the first time ever, we're gonna have wireless emergency alerts in multiple languages so people get the information they need at the most critical points in their lives when danger is uh, approaching. So with that, happy to start. Go ahead, Chris. Can you describe what that is if it's not uh renewed by then? Uh, for three decades, the FCC has had Spectrum Auction Authority. We've held 100 auctions. We've raised more than $233 billion for the United States Treasury. But most importantly, 
Those auctions have been a tool to help us lead the world in wireless. I don't want to attend the World Radio Conference with one hand tied behind my back. I think it's vitally important that Congress reinstate that authority as soon as possible. I don't think we should squander United States leadership in wireless policy. So I think we're going to need that authority back to make sure that we can continue to make sure spectrum innovation happens here on our shores first. Uh, hi, Monty, Com Daily. Um, I, I have kind of a two-part question. Uh, one, you got your first uh, real 3-2 dissenting meeting today. Has the tone of things changed on the 10th floor at all now that, you know, commissioners are sort of butting heads more? And also, uh, 20 senators just weighed in on the VMPVD thing. Uh, I was wondering, do you have it, as you're thinking on that change, is the FCC going to refresh the record on that? Uh, we'll take a look at that, uh, at that letter. And... Um, my colleagues and I continue to discuss issues we agree on, those we disagree on, and everything in between. We're making an effort to disagree without being disagreeable. I think you saw evidence of that today. I want to make sure everyone here can offer their opinion and that we make an effort to respect that opinion, whatever it may be. Uh, Madeline Hughes with MLEX. Um, and, you know, with um, the new commissioner, uh, you guys now have a majority on the commission. How is that going to evolve with what you guys are doing on the privacy front? Um, I know that the net neutrality rules are a step for that. Do you guys have anything else planned? Well, we have set up a privacy and data protection task force, and we're doing some work to try to address um, SIM swapping fraud right now, and I am hope we're going to be able to uh, have an order on that in uh, not too much time further. Uh, Sarah Friedman, Inside Cybersecurity. I wanted to find out if there was anything that was changed from the uh, MPRM that was issued as a draft um, to the final one that you approved today. Small changes, but I'm going to leave that to the Bureau press conference so they can speak to it in more precise detail. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, all. All right, thanks so much everyone. And with that, I'll welcome Katie Gorsak to the podium who will be leading our Bureau press conference. All right, hello everybody. Um, as a reminder for today's Bureau press conference, we will only take questions on the items voted at today's open meeting. And it looks like we already have a question on the first one. So we'll start off with the Wireline Competition Bureau items. We'll group them all together and then go from there. So our first item will be the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking that proposes to reestablish the Commission's authority over broadband internet access service by classifying it as a telecommunications service under Title II of the Communications Act. Any questions on this item? Okay, come on, Trent. Thank you, Katie. Nothing. Hi, so I wanted to find out uh, how you, uh, any plans to address cybersecurity and if there's anything that's changed from the draft to the final. And so I think you could expand on border gateway protocol and next steps on that. That would also be helpful. Okay. Uh, so let me start with the changes. Um, primarily, they were just additional questions. It is a notice um, where we're seeking comment on a number of different issues associated with um, our initiative here. Uh, the questions came from ex partes that we received, also from some of the other offices. We also made up, like, we also had some like, cleanup edits along the way, things like that. Um, but we hope to get the item out very soon so you'll be able to see those in great detail. Um, with respect to the other questions, do we have anything on cyber that we can talk about? There were no major changes to the, the overall discussion. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on this item? Do you, do you know when that will be released, the voted on item? Um, so we hope to release all of the items as soon as possible, particularly those where we need to seek public comment. We know that um, there's a lot of interest. We expect a very vibrant record. Um, so I don't want to give a day, but it's going to be very soon. Anything else on this one? Stay with Trent. Yep. 
Okay, are there any questions on the second WCB item, the declaratory ruling that would clarify the use of Wi-Fi on school buses? Any questions on this item? Yeah, I'd just like to know if uh, what changed from the uh, draft uh, of the school bus item. Yeah, so the only thing that changed in the item from the initial draft is we updated some of the data about what we've done with, elect with the um, ECF program. Sorry, I almost forgot your program. Um, you know, there's a lot moving in that program, and so we, we just updated the information that was in the, in the draft itself, but that was it. Any others on that item? No? And lastly, um, our last WCB item is the notice of proposed rulemaking seeking comment on the high cost program funding to continue supporting fixed and broadband so services in Alaska. It's a mouthful. Uh, any questions on this item? Okay. I have the uh, same question for that item. Yeah. Um, so there was a, a couple of cleanup edits, and we took some additional questions from ex partes and from some of the other offices. Again, that's one that we hope to get out very, very soon uh, so that you all can, can mash them up together and see what changed. But um, nothing unexpected with, you know, when we have these notices, when people tend to ask us for, for additional questions, we put them in there to, to seek a more robust public comment. Thank you. You bet. You good? Any others on that item? No? Okay. Thanks, Trent. All right, we'll next move on to the notice of inquiry on maternal health that will seek comment on a proposed plan to improve and enhance maternal health data in the Mapping Broadband Health in America platform. Are there any questions on this item? You can okay. predict what my question will be. I don't know if I can predict, but I will <laughs> wait for them to come up here and then they can answer. Thanks. All right. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to know if, uh, what, what if any changed from the uh, original draft? Yeah, so I think it's a similar answer to Trent. Clean up edits, we're gonna release it very quickly and you'll be able to do a quick comparison. Um, obviously, this is an issue that everybody cares about, so that's what you're gonna find. Um, thanks. Thank you. Okay, any others on that one? No, okay, thank you. All right, next um, is unlicensed use of the six gigahertz band. Any questions on this one? Monty? I have one. Okay, come on up. Good afternoon. I'd just like to know what changed from the uh, draft to the final version. I was anticipating <laughs> that question. Uh, so. Uh, Bottom line cuts haven't changed from, from the draft report and order. There are several things that were added as a result of ex parte presentations that were made since the public release to include a couple of areas. We've added uh, some explanatory text relating to the simulations and reasonable assumptions that were made uh, in the record and our reliance on those to come up with the, um, the technical rules for the power spectral density and so forth. We added uh, an element in there explicitly requiring contention-based protocol. It's one of the uh, parts of operations of Wi-Fi devices to mitigate the risk of uh, potential harmful interference. We also um, added um, a, a couple of elements to the further notice that uh, you'll, uh, you'll find in the release draft, one relating to a filing from the National Telecommunication Information Administration on behalf of the Department of Transportation, asking that we um, add a section related to VLP operations in the same vehicle as CV to X operations, which are in the adjacent band. So we ask um, uh, several questions related to the interactions there. Uh, and we also ask a couple of um, additional questions related to alternatives to our geofencing uh, proposals that we put in the, in, uh, in the FNPRM. Uh, if there are any other alternatives to the geofencing system that could still get us to the point with more widespread VLP operations in the um, remainder of the VLP, I'm sorry, the six gigahertz band, um, and what the details of that alternative proposal would look like um, to support any changes we would take on that. So, thank you. You're welcome. All right, lastly, we'll move on to report and order from our Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau that would improve wireless emergency alerts by making WIA messages available in additional languages, including ASL, among other improvements. Are there any questions on this item? You know there is one. I, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
uh, yeah, I, I'd like to know if this changed at all from the draft and how so. Totally caught off guard by that question. <laughs> I thought so. Um, so the order is substantially the same as the, the public draft that was released. Um, the only change that we would note is that the public draft had uh, updates to the WIA database being required to be made by wireless providers uh, within 30 days of a, of a change. Um, the, 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 final the final version of the order that was adopted will uh, require uh, filing twice per year. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions on that item? No? Okay, thank you. Uh, so this includes our Bureau press conference. I believe Commissioner Carr is here and ready to speak with you all. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Welcome back, a little bit more full crew. Not as fulsome as I would have thought, but uh, let's take what I can get, three of you. I uh, was very judicious with my words today at the meeting, so I've got a lot of uh, extra things to say at this meeting. But no, I think, obviously off the top, I want to start with what a lot of us did, which was to, to welcome Commissioner Gomez. I think she's gonna be a great uh, addition to the agency, and I really look forward to uh, working with her, and I think we're gonna find a lot of common ground on a lot of things. Um, but switching to the items today, you know, obviously Title II was the big one. I think it's been interesting to me to see the debate on this issue shift a little bit over the years. And I think it's more clear now than ever before that there's a very clear distinction between net neutrality, which are pretty simple rules, don't block, don't throttle, um, don't engage in anti-discriminatory uh, forms of prioritization. And on the other hand, Title II. And Title II comes with it a raft of all sorts of 1930 era controls that have absolutely nothing to do with net neutrality. And so I think the discussion on this um, has progressed a little bit in a, in a good way to draw the distinction between the two, and let's have a debate about that. You know, it's interesting to me that you hear today a lot of talk about how the current framework that we have, where ISPs have made disclosures to the FCC that pursuant to those, they cannot block, they can't throttle, they can't engage in prioritization. A lot of the ISPs have done that. And so today, if an ISP were to block, were to throttle, were to engage in anti-discriminatory prioritization, that would be unlawful under federal law. And FTC, the premier consumer protection agency historically, is fully empowered to take action. Now, the one critique I've heard from people on that score is that, well, it's, it's a disclosure regime, I meaning they could just make a different disclosure and they could get themselves out of it. What I would say back is, that's exactly what the D.C. Circuit said happens with Title II. So with Title II, you have no doubt that you have all these negative consequences that happen to the industry. But what Judge Srinivasan and Tatel said in their statement on the uh, rehearing petition was that even the Title II rules are disclosure rules, in the sense that if a ISP were to say, we're going to block, we're going to throttle, we're going to do prioritization, fast lanes and slow lanes, Tatel and Srinivasan said they can't. So whatever critique you have of the current approach, you catch yourself coming on the other side of it with Title II. There's been a lot of discussion here today as well about what has changed in the various items. You'll all see that for yourselves. My view is one of the things that you're gonna see that changed very significantly in the Title II decision was a substantial walk back of the preemption proposal in the circulated draft. I think a lot of people looked at that original draft and they thought, well, you know, there's a lot of bad here, but at least there's strong preemption language. Uh, I think those people will be uh, a little bit disappointed when they see ultimately what comes out from this agency. We were told in the FCC's fact sheet that we were going to get a uniform federal approach. We were told in the fact sheet that was published that we'd be voting on something that would avoid a patchwork. Um, and I think it would be interesting to stay focused on uniform and patchwork and whether the FCC was able to hold the line there from when the items circulated until it was voted today. And with that, happy to open it up to take some questions. Could you? Hi, Commissioner. You get this working. Yeah. Um, what, what's the most significant change on preemption that you're describing? Well, again, you'll see the, the details uh, as they come out. But like I said, I would just stay focused on what was represented in the fact sheet and the public uh, document about a uniform approach in avoiding a patchwork uh, of state laws. Is the, uh, I asked the chairwoman this, is the 
tone different on the 10th floor now that, you know, you guys are kind of butting heads openly? And also, how does it feel compared to the tone during the previous round of net neutrality? Because things seemed kind of mean back then. <laughs> well, look, I think as you saw, I very openly shared my snacks that I brought with my colleagues. So that things have true. not devolved so far that we are hoarding food and, and denying that from each other. I'll say this. I think something very unique happened at this agency over the last two years. By necessity or otherwise, we were 2-2, and we worked together to achieve common sense goals. And certainly not 100% of the things that we did were things that I would have done if I was alone and had the pen, and I'm sure my colleagues would say the exact same thing. But we had two years to develop a muscle memory of working together, of compromising, of finding common ground, of learning how to talk to each other about cutting deals, and about learning how to quickly get deals done. And now we know each other, we know our third rails, um, and we know how to work together. And I think that's something that's unique from you know, agencies that ran right to 3-2, that Congress that has run right to, to partisan. I'm not advocating that every two years of a presidential administration should be 2-2, but I'm saying that something happened there. And so I think as we go forward, there's going to be tough issues. Title II, a tough issue. There are going to be other tough issues. But I'm confident that we've developed something that if we're careful, we can continue to have that on the vast, vast majority of every other item. Um, I do think the collegiality here is at a level that it has not been in a long time. Um, and I'm sort of committed to trying to do that and meeting my colleagues where I can at the 50 yard line. Um, it's tough, it's tough when you get into, you know, really strong disagreements, but I'm committed to trying to make it work. And I, at this point, I think my colleagues are as well. Hi, Commissioner. Um, when it comes to the current approach before, um, there was the full seat. There was efforts to collaborate with CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Administration. Um, I was wondering um, what you think of those efforts and if you see more of an opportunity to do more going beyond national security concerns when it comes to Huawei and ZTE. Well, look, I, the chair of the agency sort of runs sort of a CEO function, and so when it comes to sort of interactions with other agencies, it's the chair that's in the lead for those things, including with CISA. So uh, I'm here, I've, I've sat in a lot of uh, different chairs, uh, but not the chair. And uh, that's one where you, know, you have much more direct role with those other agencies. What I can say on national security is sort of what I said in my statement, which is I've been here, I've had regular meetings, I've had skiff meetings. Uh, there's nothing that I have seen or heard, particularly in the last six years, that in any way supports the argument that we need Title II for national security issues. Um, we've dealt with national security issues, complicated ones, and we find ways to use our existing authority. We have gone to Congress and very quickly gotten authority, Secure Equipment Act is an example, to deal with something. Um, and so if there's an issue that we need authority to solve, I'm all ears, but there's nothing that I've heard that Title II solves, and there's nothing that I've seen in this building, in the SCIF or otherwise, that suggests that either. So I do think we need to just sort of continue to move forward, uh, but again, there's nothing that I've seen that, that would sort of suggest that Title II is an answer. In fact, the one technology that's mentioned specifically in the item, in the public item, is you know, Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, this technology, which itself, at least as I understand it, is, is, is not and would not be classified by the FCC as broadband internet access service, and therefore would not be reclassified under Title II. So again, I don't think that's an argument for why we need Title II. But other people feel, obviously, passionately and strongly the other way on this issue, and that's what we're going to have, hopefully, a good uh, discussion and debate about. Do you have any reaction to this letter from all those Democratic senators about the VMPPD? I'm always getting those letters mixed up. Uh, issue? I mean, that's a lot of congressional pressure on this, and uh, so far we haven't seen what the FCC is going to do with that. I think you've said they should reopen the record. No, I haven't said that. Look, I, I don't feel a lot of pressure coming from congressional Democrats. That's not a, a, That's a pain point that, um, that I have at this moment in my life. Um, I think when it comes to this issue, I think the agency needs to be very, very careful, once again, as we've been talking throughout these my statements today, to hew to the letter of the law that um, Congress has written. And if there's something that's outdated or something that needs to change, uh, the fact of something being outdated does not itself give rise to FCC authority or the FCC ability to uh, get a little too creative with the statute. So um, I think that is sort of my 
position at a macro level on this issue. Okay. Well, wanna, yeah. Do you, have one a, last one. do you have a view on the uh, legal challenges to the universal service funding mechanism without talking about the specific cases? Yeah, look, I haven't tracked those cases, Fifth Circuit otherwise, um, all that closely. What I can say is I've been clear that if you put the legal concerns to the side, we are stuck in a situation where we are effectively in a death spiral with the contribution factor and that we need some sort of fundamental reform. And what I have said is if we're going to have USF, which is not a debate for me because Congress passed a law saying we have to have it. Others can debate that. But me as an agency, I have to operate under the statute. The statute says we're going to have USF. And if we're going to have USF, we have to think about how do we put that on stable financial footing. And what I've articulated is I think we need to get large technology companies that benefit from the expenditure out of the USF fund to contribute into the USF fund. And I think if we do that, um, particularly with new authority, which is what I think we would need to do that, at least to fully realize my idea there, then maybe that sort of um, mitigates or eliminates some of the statutory concerns that have been raised in that case. But again, I, I do think we've got to take this on. I mean, historically, you know, this is an agency that kicks the can down the road on contribution factors. I mean, the very first assignment that I got as a baby lawyer back in 2005 was to research the contribution factor in the movement. I think it was moving from five to six to seven at that point, and now we're up to 30 plus percent. So we got to take this head on. That's part of what my thinking was on um, the Wi-Fi school bus item is that as we're expanding new categories of things to spend money on, I think it's incumbent on us to, to also look at the fundamental challenges to the USF fund itself. All right, thanks all, appreciate it.